What happens when a bank stops thinking like a bank? Instead of keeping the status quo, it challenges it. Instead of thinking about how people should bank, we should think about how we can improve their lives. Instead of just offering products and services, we create experiences. When a bank stops thinking like a bank, it changes the game. This is what we're doing. We're bringing the future of banking to the present by being forward-thinking, innovative, agile, and open. The future is not an upgrade of the present. It's about doing things in an entirely different way. It's not just about creating products and services, but about bringing the bank to our clients wherever they go. The future is about embedding banking into everyone's lives. To accelerate your growth, we are connecting you to a whole new world of opportunities. To drive you to success, we're powering the future with advanced technology and platforms. So forget what you know about banking. This is our revolution. We are transforming every transaction and interaction. Because we don't want to interrupt your life, we want you to enjoy it. We don't want to just support your business, we want to help you build it. The future is here now, and we are just beginning. We are going to transform the lives of all Filipinos. We are a company of future forward thinkers, committed to bringing dreams to life. And our focus is entirely on you. Because at Union Bank, the future begins with you. I want to make you smile. Kaya when it's time to eat, dapat laging special. San Marino Corn Tuna. Punong puno ng flavorful tuna that's rich in omega-3. Lasa pang sarap in every bite. I'm glad I get to celebrate each day with you. Pasarapin ang love with San Marino.
you've got all the news you need and more. We still have here with us members of the national women's football team who just won the title at the AFF Women's Championship. Dadalo si President-elect Bongbong Marcos sa Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEX Summit sa Thailand. Ngayong No Smoking Awareness Month, alamin natin kung paano tuluyang magkukwit. A South Commuter Railway linking Metro Manila and Laguna goes full steam ahead. Nakipagpulong ang Pangulo kay Indonesian President Joko Widodo at tinalakay nila ang iba't ibang hamong kinakarap ng ASEAN dahil sa pandemya. Itutuloy na ng Cebu City ang pagluluwag ng pagsuot ng face mask pero ayon kay Mayor Mike Rama, ito ay trial period pa lamang. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. brings home over 800 billion pesos worth of investment pledges from his state visits to Indonesia and Singapore. Tumingi na ng saklolo ang grupo ng mga panadero. Apektado na rin daw ang kanilang industriya. Ayon sa Labor Department, inaprubahan na ng National Wages Productivity Commission ang 50 pesos na dagdag sahod. information are created equal. With an abundance of sources on different platforms, experience is essential. Excellence counts. Integrity matters. Because decisions and strategies are only as good as the information you base them on. For the past 35 years, Business World has been at the forefront of business news helping shape our country's development through the leaders and people of influence who count on the paper as their primary news source. The information delivered through the pages of Business World enable decision makers to achieve important milestones as they rise and thrive even in challenging times. As Business World evolves with its audience, it has brought its legacy of reliable and credible journalism to new media to deliver more beneficial services to a growing audience. Business World is committed to having its valuable and compelling content flow seamlessly from the paper to digital, social, mobile, video, and TV to reach the people where they are. With the Philippine business landscape in a state of constant transformation, Business World will continue to evolve with the needs of its market. Despite the changes, some things will never change. Excellence anchored in untarnished integrity, now and always. Sign up for a year and pay less than 71 pesos per month. Visit tmt.ph slash digital to get your free 30 days of the Manila Times Digital Edition. This year's Phoenix Annual Conference would not have been possible if not with the support from our sponsors and partners. We would like to thank our sponsors, Platinum Sponsors, KPMG RG Manabarin Company, and Union Bank of the Philippines. Diamond Sponsors, Megaworld, Noasis Corporation, CDO Foodsphere Inc., and Vistaland. Gold Sponsors All Home Ayala Land Inc. Deloitte Institute of Management Accountants Robinson's Land Corporation Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation 
SGV and Company, and Smart Communications. Patron sponsors Video Unibank Inc., PA Grand Thornton, RCBC, FTI Consulting, San Miguel Corporation, and St. Peter Life Plan. Minor sponsors McDonald's and Wilkin Depot. We would like to thank our official broadcast partners, ANC and CNN Philippines, and our media partners, Business Mirror, Business World, Manila Bulletin, Philippine Star, and the Manila Times. Welcome to the fifth and final day of 2022 Phoenix Annual Conference, Emerging Giants in Asia Pacific. The Secret to Business Success. This event is presented by the Phoenix Week Committee. Let us all give a warm welcome to our host, Attorney Jesusa Loreto A. Arellano. She is a certified public accountant and a lawyer with extensive experience managing cross-functional finance, legal, HR, and operational teams in various industries. She is currently a director and the treasurer and CFO of Solar Philippines. Before joining Solar Philippines as its group CFO, she was with SM Investments Corporation as VP for Investments Portfolio, CFO, and treasurer of a portfolio company. Attorney Jesusa is a graduate of the University of the Philippines College of Law with a Juris Doctor degree, cum laude, class salutatorian. Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and Accountancy, cum laude. She holds a Master of Laws degree from Harvard Law School. She is admitted to practice law in the Philippines and New York. A professor at the UP College of Law and Pamantasa ng Lunsod ng Maynila. Please join us on the virtual floor, our host, Attorney Jesusa Loreto A. Arellano. Thank you for that. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final day of the 54th Phoenix Annual Conference. Our theme today is Emerging Giants in Asia Pacific, The Secret to Business Success. We have reached the last webinar of the week-long conference. Thank you for spending your week with us. I am Jing Arellano, your host for today's virtual event. Quoting from the recently released publication of KPMG in Asia's BC, a digital revolution is driving growth across Asia Pacific, transforming the way we live, work, and do business. Across the region, not only is the number of startups increasing, but so is their size and importance. Concurrently, new sectors verticals are emerging that are attracting investment dollars and inspiring more and more startup founders to enter the space. A virtuous cycle. To better understand the diversity and depth of new economy businesses in Asia Pacific, KPMG and HSBC studied 6,472 technology-focused startups with valuations of, of up to $500 million that were considered as potential emerging giants in 12 key markets, mainland China, India, Japan, Australia, Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Taiwan, and Thailand. 12 countries in total, but no Philippines. In today's session, we hope to touch on why this is so. This session is presented by the Phoenix Week Committee. We are simultaneously broadcasted live via Phoenix's official Facebook page and YouTube channel. Of course, this year's Phoenix Week would not have been possible if not for the support of our sponsors and partners. We would like to thank KPMG Manabating Company, Union Bank, Mega World, CDO Food Spear, NOAA Business Applications, Vistaland, All Home, Ayala Land, Deloitte, the Institute of Management Accountants, Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation, Robinson's Land Corporation, Smart Communications, SGV and Company, BDO, FTI Consulting, PA Grant Thornton, San Miguel Corporation, RCBC. St. Peter Life Plans, McDonald's, and Vulcan Depot. We would also like to thank our broadcast 
partners, ANC and CNN Philippines, and to our media partners, Business Mirror, Business World, Manila Bulletin, Philippine Star, and the Manila Times. Once again, a warm thank you to our dear sponsors and partners for supporting this year's Phoenix Annual Conference. And now to formally open the program, may I call on our president, Mr. Michael Arcatami Gorin, for his welcome remarks. All right. Uh, thank you, Jing. Given that introduction, I think we need you to <laughs> contribute to the discussions as well. <laughs> Maybe we'll allocate 10 to 15 minutes for you. <laughs> no, thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, uh, good morning to everyone, our Phoenix officers, members, guests, our keynote speakers, and all the participants. Uh, welcome to our fifth and final day of our 54th Phoenix Annual Conference, Reshaping the Future with Transformational Change. As mentioned by Jing, the publication we're making reference to is entitled Emerging Giants, uh, in Asia Pacific. And related to that, we'd like to have a better understanding, uh, probably on maybe some of the secrets that the companies uh, may have been doing in the past and are planning to do in the future. And then let's try to learn new things, how we can potentially transplant some of those things into the country if they're not yet here, or if they're already here, how can we then grow and make it prosper? So there is a surge in investments in new economy businesses in Asia Pacific. One clear indicator of this surge was the rise in the number of total number of unicorns, or as we all know, these are privately held startup companies with a value of over $1 billion. It grew by more than 25% uh, to over 450. So there are more than 450 unicorns in Asia Pacific alone. Uh, another indicator was the groundbreaking surge of private investments in dollar terms. Um, around $670 billion in gross private ventures were invested worldwide. So 60, $670 billion worldwide. And out of that, Asia-Pacific, there were around $193 billion uh, that was invested in Asia-Pacific, over a quarter of the total. Mm -hmm. And in terms of growth, we'd like to believe that Asia-Pacific continues to be the fastest growing uh, continent in terms of receiving these kinds of investments. And another item would be, uh, this was also reflect, this is reflected, this is reflective of the hunger on the part of investors to find new sources of strong growth that could be expected as, as the world continues to emerge from the pandemic. So it really has been and continues to be a very dynamic market around the Asia Pacific. May I invite participants, all of you guests here, to use the Q&A button to feel free to ask questions or maybe clarify any ideas that any of our keynote speakers may be sharing. Uh, so again, as mentioned by Jing, no Philippines in that study. But again, uh, we're here to learn. So question would include, is the Philippines being left behind in terms of new economy businesses that are first being set up? And since there are fewer companies being set up, it, it's a natural consequence that there will be less investments. So um, all of those questions uh, we'd like to uh, better understand through our session this morning. Again, uh, so now we're... We're about to finish the uh, annual conference, the week-long annual conference. So again, I'd like to give due recognition to the people and the leaders uh, behind uh, this entire week's celebration. So to our liaison director, Gemma Cheng, thank you. Hopefully you're in the audience right now. To our co-chairs, Migs, thank you. Migs Ramos and Renan Piamonte, thank you very much. Technical subcommittee, uh, TB, Tony Boy Ong Shaco and Paula Azurin. Good morning to our Ways and Means Subcommittee co-chairs, Goody Hernandez and Frank Isa, to our pub publication and uh, to our publication uh, subcommittee chair, Blanca Mercado, to our Phoenix Knight Subcommittee chair, Jet Pampolina, who's still abroad, and lastly to Ochi Chiquito and Bing Pas for choosing very nice food no, for us last Wednesday. <laughs> Making physical arrangements. And the, <laughs> for the physical arrangements as well, no? um, last Wednesday. So uh, we'll never grow tired, as mentioned, of thanking our 
sponsors, Platinum sponsors, KPMG, RG Manapat and Company, and Union Bank. Uh, Diamond sponsors, Mega World, CDO Foods, Fear, Loa Business Applications, Vista Land. To our gold sponsors, All Home, Ayala Land, Deloitte, the Institute of Management Accountants, Robinson's Land Corporation, SGV, Filipinas Shell, Smart Communications. To our patron sponsors, BDO, FTI Consulting, Punong Bayan in Araujo Grand Thornton, San Miguel Corporation, RCBC, and St. Peter. To our minor sponsors, McDonald's and Wilcon Depot. I would also like to thank our official broadcast partners, ANC and CNN, and to our media partners, five of them, Business Mirror, Business World, Manila Bulletin, Philippine Star, and the Manila Times. I hope everyone will enjoy this very interesting session this morning. Again, mabuhay ang Phoenix. And back to you, Jing. Thank you, President Mike, for that very insightful and warm welcome remarks. To kick off the celebration of the 54th Phoenix Annual Conference, let me call on the co-chair of Phoenix Week Committee, Ms. Maria Mignon W. Ramos, for her short message. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being here at the penultimate session of the 54th Phoenix Annual Conference. Uh, uh, you, the topic is really, really very interesting. It will, our discussion today will make it uh, evident to us what made these companies who are part of the list of emerging giants in uh, Asia Pacific um, so remarkable as to qualify for that very short list. No? And what we can do in the Philippines to be finally included in that list. I'd just like to thank people who have helped us to bring this particular uh, day session to fruition. President Mike Corinne who, for bringing the topic and session forward to us and working until it was uh, until today <laughs> for all for its success, no? as well as uh, some other people who, in the committee who were not quite the chairs but have also helped us uh, tremendously. Mr. Vic Sarza, Ms. Gay Santos, Sister Jen Pasqual, Ms. Beth Coronel, and Ms. Debbie Tan. Um, thank you very much for your help. And my co chair, uh, Renan Pampiamonte. Yeah. Good job, partner. Thank you very much. And our ever present, ever supportive liaison director, Gemma Chen. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Let's enjoy the session today. Thank you, Migs, for your message. To all our live Zoom participants and viewers from our live stream, we are thrilled to have you all join us today. Just like you, I look forward to today's discussion. So let me begin by introducing our first speaker. So our first speaker is Mr. Darius Chung. He's the founder and CEO of 99 Group, the leading real estate technology company in Southeast Asia. With the mission to build the most trusted property marketplace, 99 Group fuses data, design, and technology to help property buyers make the best decision and the biggest purchase in their life. 99 is the fastest growing property platform in Southeast Asia, operating brands including 99.co, iproperty.com.sg, srx.com.sg, and ruma123.com. It has a staff strength of over 500 and garnered over US dollars 80 million in investment from top investors including Go Capital, Sequoia, East Ventures, Alliance X, and Eduardo Saverin. Prior to uh, founding 99, Darius was the director of consumer mobile technology at McAfee, the world leader in software security. He joined McAfee through the acquisition of TenCube, a Singapore-based mobile security company he founded and served as CEO for five years. At TenCube, Darius grew the startup to a team of 26 people in two locations, raised two rounds of financing, created award-winning mobile security product Wave Secure, and led the startup to profitability. Darius was awarded the Singapore Youth Award, Singapore's highest accolade, as well as the Entrepreneur of the Year by Singapore Computer Society, an Outstanding Young Alumni Award by National University of Singapore. 
He is an angel investor in over 20 startups, an alumnus of the NUS Overseas College, Darius stud studied at National University of Singapore and Stanford University. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mr. Darius Chung. Thank you, thank you, Jing, for the incredibly kind introduction. I felt like you have already told my story, so I don't need to repeat it. Um, so it's a great privilege to be here. A big um, good morning, hi to everybody, and happy Children's Day to all those of you who have children. Um, and I was asked um, to, to, to share a little bit more about our journey, as well as some of the lessons learned we are along the way. Um, feel very privileged for the opportunity and hope uh, the materials I've prepared uh, could be interesting and meaningful for you, as well as, you know, the Q&A sessions, which we are, I'm open to take any questions about any part of my life, uh, whether it is within 99 as a company or, you know, other parts of, for example, angel investing in, you know, previous companies and so on and so forth. Okay, we'll get started right away. Um, I, I think as Jing very, very kindly mentioned, uh, we are one of the fastest growing property platform in Southeast Asia. Um, we currently have about 20 million users uses our platforms every month, and we have at any one point about 2 million properties on sale um, on our website. And we have about 500 employees, and probably what is most unique about us is that we've taken an approach, a strategy in approaching the market in deciding that we want to be you know, full stack, what we call full stack, all the way from be, being a, just a property portal to supplying data to the market and really building up a data um, set for the market, um, which we believe is the fundamental imp impediment to have to an efficient real estate market, to turning that into software and finally having a transaction services to directly help um, property sellers, specific developers sell their properties directly. Um, so some of our, my investors are already there and Jing has mentioned them, so I won't go through them again. Uh, so we started this about seven years ago because um, we found that 25 years into the internet journey, uh, many things have in, in our life has transformed, whether it's you know transport or food delivery, um, or you know uh, booking a hotel or a flight. Uh, but you know real estate has fundamentally not changed very much, and, and it's the world's largest asset class. But yet it is still the most opaque and difficult to transact. Um, if you think about it, somebody who is buying a home, a young millennial who's buying a home, is the biggest purchase they will ever make, and it's over fifty percent of their uh, net asset um, for most Asians. And, and yet, making that purchase decision is incredibly perilous. And there's a lot of information asymmetry. They're not very well educated about it in general. There's not a whole lot of data to assist them in making uh, their transaction to be the right one. So our goal is to here to change that, to make sure that the journey is trusted, is reliable, is transparent, and is supplemental with data so that the property buyer can really make the best decision um, for their life. So a little bit about the market we target. We target the six um, core markets of Southeast Asia, uh, which is accounts for 600 million in the populations, about 200 billion in residential gross transition value every year. So 200 billion dollars worth of residential property changes hand every year in these six markets. And for us, that translates into about $6 billion TAM, um, which is between primarily for sellers of property who wants to spend money on marketing or selling uh, or banks who want to originate loans. So that's essentially our, our market. Um, of course, one of the beautiful thing about in, being in Southeast Asia and spending this time with you in Philippines uh, as well is that you know, Southeast Asia is embedded with growth across all Southeast Asian markets. Um, and you know, across Southeast Asia, there's, we were going to see in the next five years about 28 million in population growth, a very, one of the fastest growing population in the world, about 38% GDP per capita growth, um, which is, of course, you know, as all of you know very well, is the fastest growing region in the world as well from a GDP step, per capita standpoint. Uh, but specifically for us, and I think major cities is, is a very, very important fact uh, that the middle class income is going to grow 2x rather than 40% in the major cities. And as the people's income go from um, go, go 2x, the amount of investable income they have will go from 5% of their income to 15% of their income. And that translates into actually effective a 6x growth in terms of um, the target market for us. So we expect the GDP growth for Southeast Asia over the next five years to be at least 50%, probably in the 80 to 90% range in terms of, um, of the market size for us. Now, we essentially focus on three things that really differentiates us. One is user experience. 
when we were the first to bring world-class design and technology to really seamlessly match users to the right property. Uh, we were the first to introduce map search and transport the POI data that really helped people find out where they want to live. Um, you would think that's intuitive because properties, location, location, location. But you know, before we came around, there's, there had not, not a whole lot of innovations. We were the first to bring this around and I think it worked incredibly well. Um, the second is to build trust uh, in many of these markets. Um, there's a lot of fake and duplicate listings. There's a lot of problems in the market where um, there's no regulations of the real estate industry. So what we did is that to build a ranking algorithm that factors in trust and quality, basically something that's more trusted turns up first, much like Google, right? Google, the first page, especially the first five links that you see on Google, you will trust those because Google have somehow done the research and figure out that these are the trustworthy sites. Um, it's the same for the same reasons, we have decided to really rank all those things based on how good quality they are, how trustworthy they are, how real they are, how, how well the agent would respond, how professional they are. Um, and with uh, and building trust into the marketplace. And the third thing with it essentially is, is building data. Um, we've uh, acquired a company called SRX, um, which has which was the first to launch um, X value, which is the first automated valuation model in Southeast Asia. Um, and it is world leading in accuracy and coverage, right? In Sing this, this currently only operates in Singapore, uh, but for Singapore, it has almost 100% coverage in terms of property. It has 98% accuracy, and it's been used 1.8 million times in last year, which is roughly translated about 13 times the number, uh, the number of transactions. So for every transaction that happens, X value has been consulted 13 times. So you, can, you would imagine everybody from the buyer to the seller, to the agents, to the bank, even the valuer, uses X value to approximate um, the, the valuation of the property. Um, and that really has a whole lot of benefits, right? It, it really brings buyers and sellers expectations together. It creates a sort of anchor and stability in the, in the market to say that this is what is expected to be the pricing, it creates some transparency, and that would lead to a lot more FinTech innovations down the road. Uh, we are very excited to launch X value for Indonesia in the coming quarter. And it is particularly challenging world where there's no transaction data exists in the market, right? In Singapore, X value is built on um, a, a database where we are the data exchange in terms of where the agencies actually pipe us the transaction data. But in Indonesia, there's no transaction data uh, publicly available. So it, it is a particularly challenging task for us, but we're pretty excited about it. Okay, so that's, um, and in, in summary, um, so we've over the last seven years, we were able to, um, to launch in two countries uh, with three acquisitions. Um, and now uh, we are the top two marketplaces in Southeast Asia, particularly number one in Indonesia with over 70% market share. We have also launched a transaction uh, business in Indonesia uh, where we directly help developers um, transact their properties. So we now put, which processes over 2000 transactions a year. Um, in terms of financing, we've raised a total of $80 million um, over the last seven years. In particular, this year, we just closed a $52 million Series C round. Uh, and I mentioned some of this in terms of the innovations. I won't bore you the details, but essentially, we, um, uh, we as a company focus a lot more on our R&D, uh, and we invest a lot as well. So our, our engineering and product team accounts for our, you know, uh, to, uh, to one third of our workforce. Um, so it's very, very material investments into R&D. And we have a deep belief that uh, innovation pays off over long, um, a long cycle, right? And it's a key differentiation over the long term. So where I think it gets a bit more interesting is to talk about some of the opportunities in time to come. And I know I'm speaking to um, some of the best uh, finance operators and finance uh, professionals in Philippines. And where we see as we, moving forward after this round of funding is not only expanding in markets uh, in terms of geographical footprint and deepening our business model in each of these countries uh, on our existing business, but where we see a big opportunity is really finance innovation in time to come. And I'll touch on five of this, uh, and some of this could be interesting to you. One is in terms of rapid issuance of loans, and, and especially in markets like Indonesia, we see day-to-day, -day, right? There's lack of centralized systems and data based on simple things like identity and title deeds. Um, and lack of centralized credit score and history that you can reliably be able to um, predict a person's credit, uh, credit score. And more importantly, the fundamental is there's a large portion of the economy, the income that's informal and cash-based, right? And, and, and the bank has, is still very, very slow in being able to process them and absorb them and issue loans. Um, time and again, in our, in, in, our, in our business where we see demand meets supply, 
we see that really what's blocking the demand and supply uh, coming together as a transaction um, is really the ability to issue loans. Um, and we think there's a lot more credit worthy customers in the market than as than the loans actually being issued today. Um, and you know, a, a, when we see the banks compete with each other, one of the interesting things is that speed really, really matters. Uh, in a lot of these markets, actually consumers really care about how fast can they get approved. The first, first one approved actually wins. Um, and sometimes it's not even about cost or interest, right? Uh, speed really matters. Uh, the next is related. Uh, there are many credit worthy buyers that are missed by the banks I mentioned just now. Uh, one is that they could lack a down payment. Um, number two, they can lack a credit history. And that's related to the fact that they might be having um, an informal income. So if they're a Grab driver, if they're, uh, for example, a, a, a Toko B, um, a, a Lazada Sada, for example, um, and they may not have, that income may not be recognized by the bank, but yet they are actually credit worthy. In our transaction business, we see this every day. 25% of our customers are actually credit, is credit worthy, but not getting bank loans. Um, and we, we think deeply about how can we make sure that they get financing, that, they, that is appropriate, that they actually can afford to pay on a monthly basis. Um, and of course, finally, is a lack of reliable property pricing data because it's a secured loan. So if you don't know how to price the property, you don't know how to assess risk. Uh, and that continue to be a problem in the market that is really becoming an impediment to mortgage issuance as well as you know, the securitization of this down the road as well. Um, later, I, I, underst I understood that you would hear from Homebase. It's a fantastic company. I'm an angel investor in it. Um, and they've done a, a fantastic job in uh, running a rent-to-own uh, product in Vietnam for these specific purposes. Our next is rapid liquidity for owners. And um, in particular, throughout COVID, as well as in the time to come, we all know in the next two to three years, uh, it's a very volatile economic um, future. Uh, there's many, many assets owners. Um, these, are these tend to be business owners as well. Um, and sometimes they would run this into circumstance where, when they need liquidity. Um, and we see many opportunities in the market where they actually need rapid liquidity and will pay premium for it. Um, however, due to the lack of pricing and transparency, um, in, in transparency in pricing data. Uh, again, it rapid liquidity seems to be a very challenging task um, in the markets we operated. Uh, the next two are quite interesting in terms of fractional ownership. Uh, real estate as an asset class, of course, is the largest asset class. Um, there continue to be a lot of uh, Im impediments for capital that wants to get into this asset class, but yet un unable to. Um, of course, the very large guys like the Blackstones and the GICs, they've got very, very large opportunities. They work on billion dollar projects. Um, but the, 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 the high return projects in the market that we see actually tend to be within the 50 to $100 million range, uh, at least in Indonesia it is. Um, and many of these opportunities are either too small or they have some problems that these big investors cannot get into. Uh, the question is how, how can we create a fractional ownership platform that actually allow capital to flow into this very significant and very safe asset class and I would argue in time to come, uh, provide a very good returns, very competitive returns compared to other asset classes as well. Um, and finally, uh, fractional ownership. And the, there's a rise of affluence uh, customers in Southeast Asia um, who might be buying a second home, a vacation home. Uh, or in some cases, digital nomads, whereby they are living in Bali for three months and then Cebu in three months and then Halong Bay for three months uh, in a year, right? Um, and these customers, they don't really use the home for the full year. They really only need it for typically one eighth of the one eighth of the year. Now the question is, what there's lack of manage, um, lack of professional management that allows them to be able to own this home, and yet be able to uh, generate yield, for example, for the rest of the home. The question we have is, and and we see this happening informally, right? Many vacation spots we actually see people, you know three or four friends, five or six friends coming together, say, hey, let's buy this home and share it together. But that's a very, very challenging process, right? How do you, if one of you want to sell, then what happens? Um, so there's a big opportunity for a fractional ownership in lifestyle as well. So these are some of the opportunities we see in the market in the time to come. And uh, we think they are actually uh, quite interesting. We are working on some of them. Uh, I know when I'm speaking to a, a big crowd of finance professionals, if you are interested in, this is the plug for us. If you're interested in uh, working on some of this for us, or if you have already worked on some of this for us, please come and talk to us. I would love to get in touch with you, make a connections. Um, and uh, if you are, whether you're a bank or developer and you're, there's something you, you're interested to implement for your own business, uh, we would love to see if there's opportunity to partner with you as well.
And I've been asked to share a few more lessons in terms of entre uh, my entrepreneurial journey. I'll quickly run, run through them. I know time is running a bit, uh, a bit uh, late. Um, so one is, so first I'll talk a few things about Southeast Asia market as well as how some of our experience. Uh, one, in terms of working in Southeast Asia, uh, certainly it's a very uneven market, right? I think especially coming from you, coming from outside, uh, you guys know this very well, but you know, I've, we talk to many investors coming from outside, they look at Southeast Asia as one market, it is not. Uh, it, it, it's at least six different markets and probably more if you look inside the country and, and start dividing it up as well. Um, so um, I, I won't bore you with too much of the details, but if you look at this quite simply, if you look at um, let me, let me try to up. This, if you look at the population size, obviously very, very, very pop population size. And for us, what we care about is the residential GDP, transaction value uh, the, every year. And if, you, and if you look at these two putting side by side in comparison, um, there's a huge discrepancy between um, what Singapore is at 11,000 uh, GDP per, per population um, to the lowest Indonesia, where it's $112,000 uh, $112, um, GDP per population a year. So that's really a, a very, very big discrepancy in terms of the markets. Um, and with this relates to the next point, right? But it is a big market. And it's still very, very early stages in, in terms of growth. Some of the biggest notable cities in the world, if you look at New York, San Francisco, London, Hong Kong, Tel Aviv, if you add that up, there's about 30 million people. And if you look at five largest cities in Southeast Asia, um, Jakarta, Manila, Bangkok, KL, Ho Chi Minh, um, and if you add them together, it's three times the size in terms of population. Um, and just Jakarta alone is already larger than these top five cities of the world combined. Uh, so this is how big Southeast Asia is in many Foreign investors in particular uh, lack the sense of scale on how big and this these populations actually are. Uh, now, of course, the income it is still quite low, relatively speaking, but income is something that can grow rapidly. Uh, income is something from a velocity standpoint, income can grow much faster than population. Uh, and I think that's that's where a lot of the potential is, and that's why that's what we are very excited about. However, the cultures are entirely different though. Um, all of you would know very well uh, that it's, you know five, six different languages in um, in six different cities and four different re key religions, um, and you know this is not even beginning to talk about the idiosyncrasies. And I certainly wouldn't bore you with you know the the, the local um, you know company law and labor law and property laws and taxes and all of those details. Um, and there's a whole movie made about the cultural cultures being different as well. Um, and for us, I think uh, we we look at it as both a challenge, but also a moat. If you can solve this, it is really, really hard. Um, so a, a lot of investors would ask us, hey, aren't you worried some guys with a lot of money coming from China, coming from the US, can't they just really take it, take it, take it by storm and, um, and conquer the market before you can? Um, so certainly that's a thesis, but we have not seen it to be successful. Right? Most of the Southeast Asian unicorns, as, um, as Mike mentioned just now, they are homegrown. Right, outside invaders have not have not been successful in in being able to 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 win, and primarily it's because of these reasons, in my opinion, right? Because it's actually very different markets. You cannot take a unilateral approach to say that this is this is how we do things and run it and actually scale it, because you actually need to adapt locally to the cultures. Um, and one of which, as an example from a product perspective, and this is something we learn the hard way ourselves, and this used to be what our app. It looks like for consumers, uh, sorry, for agents. Um, and now this is what it looks like. Um, and I'll give you the other example first, then I'll explain. So this is what Grab looks like, and this is what Uber used to look like. Of course, Uber doesn't operate anymore. Um, the, the key thing I want to focus here is this, right? Uh, we used to take a, take a US approach. I'm partially US educated. So I, I think this US approach of simplicity and elegance and um, and you know we hide a lot of the features and products inside this little burger bar. Um, these three lines here, and you see many apps have it, but uh, it, you know, through many of our user experience testing, we realize that actually consumers don't understand what that is. Nobody clicks on that because they don't know what's hidden in it. If you want them to see something, you kind of have to put it on the front and center on the screen, right? So, and this is how it looks like today because through many iterations, we learned that actually the most effective thing is just put every, every option on the screen up front. Uh, if you try to be elegant and hide it in a burger bar, nobody understands it. Um, so this is some of the cultural differences of you know what, what we call the East Southeast Asia uh, compared to the West. Um, and we've learned that overall, um, just a general uh, heuristic is much better to copy from China, where the behavior 
and the stage uh, and, uh, and internet education level is much more similar um, than it is from the US. Uh, next is a multi-channel, multi-touch point in the sense that every single market, and this is borrowing from an example of uh, a company my wife runs called the Asian Parent. Um, and so borrowing an example, we, what she has also find that in every single market, the channels of how people communicate and how people share are very, very different. You have to adapt locally as well. Um, as an example, jump in straight to it. Uh, in Thailand, for example, it's incredibly important for you to, to have line. Right? If you're a content company, you want, you know, uh, or if you have con content components of your business, um, it, it, you know, WhatsApp is actually not the, not the defect, default, de facto, right? Line is the de facto communication platform. So you need to make sure that people are able to chat online, to talk to you online, share contents online, so on and so forth. And similarly in Vietnam, it is Zalo. Right? So actually, you need to adapt to local markets, not just um, in terms of user experience, but also the channel of how, how they communicate. Uh, so this, whether it is chatting, whether it's friends, uh, social network, whether it is images, whether it's video, or even in, in some cases, even processing payments. I'm sure all of you know, payment gateways are also localized as well. Um, and and uh, the other thing is Southeast Asia is still very much offline. Right, with we as a tech company, uh, my roots is a you know I used to run a cybersecurity company, which is of course a tech company. We, we there were twenty five of us. We sit in the office. We don't go out to anybody to meet anybody. Um, everything is done online. Uh, but now I've completely changed our mindset. Right, like we actually needs to be offline a whole lot, um, because in Southeast Asia, most consumers they are still new to internet. Yes, they are. Yes, the internet penetration rate is getting pretty good, but there is a certain thing that doesn't show in. Um, in, in, in the numbers, which is the age and the familiarity and the adoption and how much to trust the internet. So that doesn't show up in numbers um, because many consumers are new to the internet. They are just getting used to online transactions. And COVID helped a lot in terms of pushing e-commerce and pushing some of this forward. Um, but e-commerce, small dollar purchases is still where it is today. Um, and for major transactions or major decisions, uh, offline still provides a whole lot of trust. Um, so it's really incredibly important uh, to do this, to, to not draw the line between online and offline and say that online must be online, offline must be offline. And, and, and as an organization, if you're running, I'm sure many of you are running digital initiatives. The question is, how do you find a synergy rather than separate? Uh, if they're competing with each other, that, that, that's a problem. Um, so for example, there's a lot of things that have, a, a lot of um, activities that we find very successful. They include doing online acquisitions. Somebody find us online through Google search, something like that and then end up actually uh, the activation for them to, for example, make a purchase to apply for a loan, it is actually offline. They actually need to turn up somewhere in person in order for them to feel comfortable in doing this. Yet at the same time, there are often many users that we acquire offline. Somebody come to a booth, find out about property, learn about it, and we turn them into an online retention because we capture the email, we start sending them emails and educational content, sending them listings, sending them calculators to help them understand their financial status. Uh, and, and to do an online retention. Um, and finally, next, um, one of the biggest challenges, uh, um, biggest challenges that we face as a company, uh, and I think most tech companies will tell you this is one of the biggest challenges, talent recruitment um, talent and talent retention. Um, and for us, we're just starting this new program where we internally, we wanted to drive to make sure that um, all of our employees actually get to own a home, right? We are a company about homes, but yet not all of our employees can afford to own a home. Uh, and, and we realized that through a year of research, we realized that actually it's a lot to do with financial literacy. Um, they have not understood, uh, even our own employees working in the industry have not understood how do you save up, how do you actually, what are financing options, how do you actually purchase a house, and is that a good decision? That's a, does that really help you build asset value over time? Um, and I think that purpose in helping people find homes really is an important element for us to be able to retain our talents uh, we inherently feel good about selling a property uh, be, because we know the alternative, our chances are, is the customers is really um, spending their money uh, or, maybe, or even worse, you know, borrowing money to buy things that they might not need. You know, they might be buying a new handphone or a, or a trip or a handbag um, on a buy now, pay later installment scheme and which only lead them into getting trouble. So we feel inherently good um, about selling a property to somebody in our markets. This is not always the case compared to the Western markets, but in our markets, we feel inherently good because we think that inherently is, is a for-saving scheme. It is helping them being financially disciplined, 
make sure that you know somewhere between 40 50 percent of the income goes into um, goes to the house payments which then becomes an asset for them over time and that purpose is something that we try to articulate as much as possible within the team and 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 help us uh, as part of our uh, the reason for people to join us um, because we think that helping people build a home and build that build that build a stable financial um, eco- uh, financial uh, stability for the home uh, is a really important part for the economy and for the nation. Um, so that's it. I think it's some of the lessons learned. I know we overran a little bit and no hopefully problem. we've got some time left for Q&A. So thank you very much. All right. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darius. I learned a lot. Uh, thank you for your great introduction of your company and for sharing your insights and learnings. I'm sure we will have a very good Q&A, which will be facilitated by our president, Mike Green. Mike, take it away. All right. And then um, before I start with the actual uh, Q&A specific to uh, Darius, uh, we wanted to inform everyone that Darius uh, ne- needs to leave. No? He won't be part of the uh, group panel discussion. So uh, feel free to post your questions uh, in our Q&A. And then Darius, feel free to let us know. Uh, I, I I know we said 10 a.m., but if you, if you need to leave a few minutes before, then we, we don't want to keep No, 10 you. is good. In fact, I can overrun to 10.05. I put in some buffer. <laughs> but 10.05, right. I do need to go. Yeah. All right. And then I'd likewise ask uh, Dean Robbie no, uh, to ask a few questions. But uh, if you'll allow me to start. Um, for first question, I may have missed this, Darius, in your discussion. Do you already have presence one way or another in the Philippines? It's No, it's, not yet. No, no, for sure. Okay. And then, no, not yet. Uh, and let me just take a plug as well. If you know of yes. any companies who's working on something like similar <laughs> to us uh, or some, you know, put, like just put it, put it quite bluntly, potentially acquisition target for us, please send them along. <laughs> okay. All right. And then uh, I, I guess one one insight that I'd like to maybe dig deeper in would be the manpower, you know, um, mm. within the 99 group. Um, based on the introductions, there, there are around 500. I'm not sure if that's close no, to the present. And then connecting that to uh, the features that you're regularly updating uh, in, in your app, uh, as you mentioned, you are the leading prop tech uh, innovator in Southeast Asia. And um, in terms of where majority of your employees are, in which function, finance, data and analytics, market research, um, if it's not trade secret, maybe to the extent that you can share, um, where do you need more people in? Which departments or groups? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I think, um, I don't think that is, so if you, I, I can answer for ourselves and then I maybe I can say that in, in general, I'll say that for prop tech companies, it really, there's no right answer in terms of where it is to invest the talent. For us, uh, because we start off as uh, a tech company, so all three of the founders are tech background. We actually have no real estate background um, when, before we started the company. Um, so it's natural for us to invest in tech being the heaviest. So tech definitely. Uh, so tech and product is the heaviest for us. It's about 180 people off the 500 people that we have. So it's about one third um, of our workforce. Um, it is certainly the heaviest investment for us. Uh, but we have uh, decidedly also right from the start blend in uh, property expertise. So we've specifically recruited from the property industry because we take an approach to, to respect the property industry rather than coming in from a tech perspective and say, that, hey, we can disrupt everything and change everything. We don't think that's the case. We think that it is about synergizing and finding how we complement the existing processes and existing uh, industry. Um, so we have a plan of tech, um, real estate professionals. Uh, and I think moving forward, what we realize is that actually what we need is to add a lot of finance professionals. Mm. Um, so to answer your question, uh, certainly we're expanding in in, a, in our tech workforce, tech workforce. Uh, but certainly, I think we are looking to add a lot, a whole lot more of uh, finance professionals as well, uh, because property is so intrinsically tied to prop in, in to to financing. And I mentioned just now some of the big opportunities we can we are working on are fintech related. Okay, so so thank you for that, Darius. And then. Um... So, so, so that's in relation to the manpower complement. Um, and then another item that I think cuts across countries and cuts across companies would be people retention and people recruitment. I'd like to think that it may be more challenging for a tech company, given that 
a lot a lot of uh, other tech companies are on the rise or are being set up there therefore it's likewise very competitive now when it comes to you uh, so is that assessment correct uh, do you feel the competition for talent is more intense now and then number two uh, maybe some strategies uh, that you have in place uh, that in order to help with recruitment and help with retention uh, yeah absolutely so uh, first of all it absolutely has grown more and more intense every year over the last seven years. Um, I would say that this year might be the first year we're seeing it slow down in terms of competitiveness. Um, and uh, for us to speak quite bluntly, the, what, we, um, uh, have, what, what we think is an opportunity for us is in the next two years, it, the, the competition might slow down. Um, and that's, that, you know, that's, that's good for us. But more importantly, for us, from a strategy standpoint, first of all, I think uh, the, a lot of the comp comp competition from, for talent actually comes from uh, a lot of venture funding, a lot of investments that mm. get poured into many, many unicorns, as you mentioned. And uh, they are hiring a lot. Sometimes they are paying a lot and they, they give huge salary hikes just to recruit people. Now, we, we think that that's stopping in the next two years to come. Um, and for us, more importantly, uh, we our strategy is to uh, make sure that we actually stay quite lean. And to be honest, 500 is actually quite lean. 180 people tag team is considered quite lean um, uh -huh. in, in compared to our counterparts. Uh, and we don't need a whole lot of people. And we our strategy is to recruit people who are specifically interested in our purpose, in our mission, to help people find their homes. Uh, often we find that actually we our talents is a little bit older um, and mm -hmm. they have some experience in purchasing their own home. They have, ex they have a, a first-hand experience in, in the pain points. Um, and I think that's something that is quite unique about us because, you know, essentially one of the best things is to work on a problem you personally have felt or want to solve uh, because you are expecting to do it. That's true. Okay. Thank you, Darius. And then before I turn over the virtual floor to Dean Robbie, maybe I'll ask one more question. Sure. Um, so you, you may have mentioned this earlier, Darius, but uh, how did you conceptualize this business model? Uh, were there uh, other companies in Singapore or maybe through your exposure in Stanford that served as your guide or model for coming up with uh, this uh, type of property tech company? Yeah, uh, to be quite candid, I think um, because property is such a big business in every country, in every region, right? Um, so you would find very, very large property business or prop, prop tech businesses in the US, in China, India, Europe, Anywhere you any anywhere you scan, um, and in fact, you know many countries as small as you know uh, just one European nation, for example, you will find two or three unicorns in just property alone. Um, and I think that from that perspective, it's not hard to um, to figure out the business model. So our business model is that we have one the classified business, a marketplace business where sellers basically pays a fee um, in advertising their property. And we have a transaction business where we work with developers directly on a success basis uh, when we actually sell property and they pay us a fee. So pretty straightforward business model. Um, I, I think the discovering or designing a business model is not very challenging. Uh, what is challenging is adapting it to local markets. And I think that is where, where a lot of the work that goes into in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, really understanding uh, the customers, um, a lot of face time I spend, you know, at least a third, maybe half of my time uh, with customers, whether it's a property developer, whether it's a real estate agent, um, and really understanding uh, this very evolving uh, environment. <coughs> and the other thing that really is challenging is the speed that evolves. Um, and, and in a market like US, we see that the, you know, the business model for developers, real estate agencies, they are very, very established and hasn't changed for the last 10 years. Whereas in Southeast Asia, it's changing all the time. All right. Okay. So their environment is changing and we need to adapt to that and really help um, supplement their business and understand their, their pain points and their priorities. Um, I think that's, that's really where the challenge is. I, uh, there's, no better, there's no good answer or solution. It's just spending time and being a good product developer and understanding you know, your customer's pain point. All right. Um, thank you, Darius. Uh, over to you, Dean Ravi. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions you might have. Hi, Darius. Uh, good morning. So I just wanted to ask, from coming from a university that uh, produces uh, startups, 
Right. Can I ask about your angel investor hat? So when you look for a company or when you're assessing a company as whether or not to invest, what do you generally look for? Is it like the business model, the product market fit, the founders themselves? What are like the key things that you would look for to say that this guy will be successful and therefore, you know, it's worth investing in this company? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So uh, I, first of all, I, I want to clarify, I'm usually very, very early. Um, so okay. I'm often the first check or, you know, first three checks um, for a startup. And at that stage, this is a startup often at the idea stage or maybe they're working a prototype, they have no traction whatsoever. This is the stage I'm investing in, which of course is very different from C or A or B stage where you actually mm -hmm. want to analyze data, analyze market, analyze customer behavior. Um, so for me, at, at my stage, is really about the people. Um, so usually I would, you know, understand what the business idea is. That's a basic sanity check. Does it have a market? Mm -hmm. Does the business model work? Have you thought through this, this and that? But that's actually very, very quick. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. Uh, it's very, very different from a due diligence process and later stage investors would do. Um, but I will share some secrets where I would, uh, the secret heuristic is this. <laughs> I mm -hmm. check whether they are working on a Friday night at 11 p.m. <laughs> I Facebook stalk them to see what they post on Facebook <laughs> um, and how authentically passionate they are about their subject matter. Um, and I have invested into companies where until today, two years later, I still have no idea what they do. But it's a successful <laughs> company. <laughs> right? But it's just oh. because the guys were so good. Um, mm. And uh, so I think that's my heuristic as an angel investor. It's very, very early stage. Um, uh, yeah. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> That's very interesting, no? Because uh, yeah, we're also trying to understand what would make our our the startups that go through our program more enticing and more you know more um, investable. Um, and to switch to another topic, um, so now we feel that interest rates you know have been rising and will probably rise some more, and you have a lot more inflation and volatility in the markets. Um, how is ninety nine dot co preparing for you know for this right property? You know, it's very, very much affected by interest rate changes, and therefore, you know, what kind of things do you foresee, especially across our different Southeast Asian markets? Yeah, certainly, um, it, it is both an opportunity and a threat, right? The threat is that if you don't do anything about it, certainly there's there's going to be a lot of problems in the market, uh, but the problems are also opportunities. Mm. Um, so, and which is you know some of the things that I've mentioned just now, for example, we see interest rate going up, there might be people who might go into, for example, default of their property. The question then is, okay, well, if you don't do anything about it, they're going to go into default, the bank's going to repossess, so on and so forth. It, it is going to happen, right? We all know it's, it is actually going to happen to some degree. We just know how bad it's going to be. Um, the question then is, okay, is there a path that we can create for them that actually is going to be a good path? Can we, for example, uh, in the US and Europe, you've seen some of these products such as, okay, you have a, a sell, and, sell and rent scheme. Right, I provide you a liquidity upfront. You you get to sell your house. You have to actually you don't have to go into this repossession process, which in many markets tend to be very painful and in itself costly. The process itself actually costs more than what you can recover, right? Um, so um, and and that helps the bank solve the NPL problem. Um, and at the same time, we provide the customer liquidity, and they can rent back the same place. Um, and that, that's an example of something that we are thinking about that provide rapid liquidity in the market. Um, so uh, that's just one example, but I think uh, uh, we, we do think that, that said, we do think that um, while it's going to hit us, it is not going to hit us as hard in Southeast Asia as other markets. Um, Southeast Asian markets are, tend to be more resilient, in particular in, 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 in the coming two to three years, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dean Rabi. And then, Darius, uh, we will take one question that was raised from one of our participants, from Waldo Bea. Uh, thanks for the inf insightful sharing. How did your team overcome any barriers to adoption, especially when first launching? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, uh, great question. Thank you very much for it. Uh, uh, first of all, I will say that um, actually we didn't run into this challenge in the beginning we run into it two years in, right? When we first launched the, the product, actually, uh, in fact, we only were tackling the rental markets. Um, and we essentially took the listings and put it on a map and it was so incredibly successful that traffic just started coming in. People were just telling each other and it, it, it was just growing by itself. We didn't have to have a lot of um, adoption 
um, drive in terms of marketing spend and so on. Uh, where we start running into challenges about one, one, one and a half, two years in, where we start tackling uh, a broader set of markets, for example, for the for sale market. In the for sale market, while it is important to find out the location and where the property actually is, there's actually a lot more consideration that we didn't think of. For example, property price, for example, comparable properties, uh, taxes, many, many other considerations that if you're renting, you don't think too much about. But if you're, if you're buying, and also because buying is a much bigger transaction, right? You buy once in every five to seven years. Uh, it's a lot of income that goes going to go in. So people will spend a lot more time. It's a six months process rather than a two weeks process. So people spend a lot more time trying to figure out, can I afford it? Should, is this the best choice that they spend time in going through every single this thing that, that is out there to make sure they get the best deal. So those challenges actually comes in the second, um, second phase uh, as we were expanding. Um, and to answer your question, how do we overcome that? Uh, painfully, <laughs> we made lots of mistakes <laughs> along the way. Uh, lots of things that we missed out that should have done earlier and should have figured out earlier. Um, but painfully, we learned um, the experience of what actually um, uh, uh, works and then build it and then market it, communicate it. Um, I'll say maybe the lesson learned there is essentially this, which is that um, it, it go as narrow as possible in defining your customers. So we define our customers in, as renters in the beginning. When we expand, and we found early success there. When we expanded the sales, we didn't take the effort to really, okay, who is the sales customer and what do they need? We didn't do the exercise, which would, would have prevented a lot of the pain that we gone, gone through. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. All right. Thank you, Darius. Uh, so that actually completes it. Um, we know that you have to go, but may, may I ask the Secretariat, uh, while Darius is still here, if we can present our Certificate of Appreciation, um, let me know, Aljon or Marga, if we have that ready on hand. So that before yes, Darius... sir. All right. Oh, perfect. Perfect. So while you're still here, Darius, we'd like to give you the... Uh, the so the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines would like to give you our certificate of uh, appreciation. Thank you. You're very kind. I haven't memorized it yet, but I'm waiting for it to. All right. So this certificate of appreciation to you, Mr. Darius Chung, in recognition of your generosity in sharing your valuable time, knowledge, and insights as a, as our guest speaker in the 2022 Phoenix Annual Conference with the theme. Emerging Giants in Asia Pacific, the success, uh, the secret to business success, given the seventh day of October 2022 via Zoom, signed by yours truly. Again, uh, we truly appreciate uh, Darius, your presence. We know how busy people of your type are, the series, <laughs> the co the founders, the CEOs, those who are who find geography irrelevant, but they're always on the go. And hopefully, uh I don't know how often you get to visit the Philippines, but on your next visit, uh, kindly let us know. We'll make sure that there will be a group of Phoenix people who will be taking you out for drinks and good food. So Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna call on that someday. <laughs> well, you're very kind. The honor is mine. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Phoenix. It sounds like a great conference. I wish I could attend more of it. But thank you for having me today. All right. Take care, Darius. Um, Take care. I'd like to hand over the virtual floor back to our MC, uh, Jing. Over to you, please. Thank you, Mike. That was a great start. Thank you, Darius, again. So let's now go to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Mr. Darren Yong, Asia-Pacific Head of Client and Market Development and Head of Technology, Media, and Telecom of KPMG Asia-Pacific. Asia a highly accomplished executive with over 20 years of experience in telecommunications and information technology, Darren is passionate about bringing emerging technology, technology solutions to clients. Darren has led key technology engagements in KPMG, which covers strategy, data migration, cloud, and blockchain among, blockchain, among others. He has supported clients across telecommunications, technology, banking, insurance, life sciences, energy, and retail sectors. Prior to joining KPMG, Darren worked in the technology industry where he held key positions in some of the largest telecommunications and technology organizations. He graduated from the University of Sydney where he took up commerce, corporate law, and finance. Let us all welcome our second speaker, Mr. Darren Young. Oh, hi everyone. And uh, thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction. And um, uh, and I think also for Phoenix for having me here, it's been great uh, to, to be here today. 
Um, uh, this last session was great, actually. A lot of the conversations that Darius mentioned, I feel align very much to the, the conversations which we'll have today. And, um, you know, the, the words around emerging giants in Asia Pacific, um, perhaps I could start with the why, why we did this. And I think that would allude to many of the audience here. So, you know, a couple of, about a year ago, we, we started thinking about um, all the tech companies that were emerging in Asia. And I, I know many of you have heard all the, the big brand names, um, the Ubers, uh, the Amazons, uh, all the big tech giants uh, that were taking, uh, that were sort of emerging out of the, the global landscape. But I think if we reflect in Asia Pacific, there were so many different things that were happening in Asia. And I feel that, uh, you know, we, we, we wanted to have an opportunity here to, to really share and show what Asia Pacific was all about and all the innovative and really uh, creative things that were taking place uh, in the region. So um, today I'll, I'll share with you um, the, the inputs of our slide um, and, and the research. And hopefully from that, uh, you'll get a bit of a sense as to, uh, you know, all the future companies that are rising in Asia. So as mentioned, um, we looked at around six and a half thousand startups in Asia Pacific, and we, and we drew the line around 500 million or less. And um, we cast the net over markets in the entire Asia Pacific. Uh, and in doing so, um, that was kind of a very broad uh, scope of, you know, where all the companies were, those that were pre-unicorns, uh, that, were, that were small enough for us to be able to, to um, see, you know, who, are, who is going to be the next unicorn and, and in which countries across the region. Uh, from that report, and if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I, I encourage you to, to download it. Um, uh, we, uh, we looked at the top 100 in Asia Pacific, and I'll share with you a bit more detail about that in a second. But the top 100 were heavily weighted with China and India and then Japan and a few other markets across the region. So no surprises there for the top 100. But what we then did was we said, well, what if we just look at the top 10 across 12 key markets in Asia? So um, that took us a bit more in a bit more detail around each of the countries and what's happening. And so we started to analyze those companies, have a better feel as to what type of areas they're investing in. Uh, and we really tried to orientate the conversation or the analysis around uh, technology orientated. Um, and so we'll share a bit more in a second around what we saw and uh, the type of insights that, we, that came out of that. So as part of this, we looked at broadly the six key trends. And, and I want to talk you through these trends that we, we saw in each of these markets. Um, the first trend was obviously the region-wide growth. So I, I mentioned earlier about you know, what's happening in the US, but it was very, very clear that between each market, there was a very different uh, growth trajectory. Um, China was, you know, of all the top 10 in China, you know, they were all worth um, half a billion dollars each. And actually their depth of the number of companies um, and what they were doing was extremely, was, was very, very um, deep. Um, so very, very large number of tech uh, startups in China. Uh, and that was also the same for India. Um, India and China, I think roughly took around 60% of the top 100 companies that we listed. But also what was interesting is when we looked at ASEAN, there was a huge number of um, innovative startups across all different markets in, in the region. And so, you know, Darius mentioned around this point of um, localization, and I'll touch on that point in a second. But, you know, what we started to see was every one of these companies were very uh, locally orientated in the way that they were trying to disrupt and use technology. The second trend that we wanted to, we highlighted was B2C and B2B. So um, what we started to see a, a, a strong sort of uprising is the more the B2B element. So, you know, with um, data and technology, um, the ability to, to understand uh, the consumer with data and information has been quite clearly um, made clear in terms of the way businesses are operating now. So just an example, just now Darius went through that whole consumer engagement with uh, the real estate and the way that you would sort of purchase and rent and buy property. But what we're starting to see is that, let's use that example, is that the B2B landscape of people who operate on that platform 
creates another layer of adjacency and another, another set of information. And this goes to things like shopping platforms where suppliers are starting to now see information around who's buying what goods, uh, who's buying, uh, for example, in, in Malaysia, uh, motorcycle companies is dealing with spare parts. This information is all now on a platform and software. And so what we're starting to see is that information that leads from B2C and B2B starts to create another layer of transactions where you can embed payments, you can offer credit, you can interact through a different layer of information. And so this world of physical going to a store and buying something to a digital doing that thing online has created a different way of working across each part of the business and every single country is different. Of all the companies that were listed, 80% of all the companies we found were platform or software enabled. And what that means is that any company, uh, any country or any startup can basically build a business based on software and having a platform approach. So if you just think about that for a moment from your point of view and your businesses, that is really disrupting the everyday things that we are used to. And obviously with COVID, the digital disruption that's basically uh, really, really coming, coming to bear across all the businesses that we operate on. So that was a really clear standout. And I think that, that again was emphasized with, with Darius just now. The other areas around the demographic drivers. So, you know, um, you know, Philippines, Vietnam, many of these markets have a, have a digital first, uh, digital savvy Gen Z population. Um, and the expectations around what people want and how they interact, as you know, is all via the mobile phone. And so because of that, people are used to now downloading apps. The, there's a low, uh, less hesitation on trying something different. Um, that barrier to entry has lowered. COVID has advanced that ability. And so with the demographic drivers of not just the generation that is used to this digital platform, all of these individuals will be the B2B, B2C of the future. And that, that whole investment around how do we capture those dem um, demographic populations, the younger generations digitally with new business models was very, it was actually quite evident as well. Localized business model, so we, what we call hyper-localization. So it was very evident that um, every, every country had its own version of something. So it could be you know, your online food delivery service or your transport service or um, your whatever it, that, that may be. So the localization of the US style models are being you know, locally executed. And this goes back to one size fits all in the type of business model, but not one size fits all in the way you execute that local business model. So this is really quite critical because when you go to compete in a Philippines or Vietnam or Malaysia or any market of Korea, Japan, that ability to understand that local business model, applying the demographics, that whole B2B, B2C transformation and the way you disrupt, all of those elements come towards the whole drive of innovation within that country. So therefore, the opportunity still exists if you understand those niche challenges and those distinct local cultures that need to be addressed in each market. We all know about the challenges around supply chain, uh, and this came out quite pronounced. So obviously with COVID and the challenges around manufacturing, um, the move towards digitization um, across the region, what we started to see more around is also solutions around leveraging information around movement of goods. So I think all of us are used to having all these uh, goods delivered to our home, um, you know, during COVID, um, being locked in home, but we're delivering food, uh, jumping on Amazon or your, or your local uh, e-commerce store and getting um, stuff delivered. Like that whole change of the way things are being delivered uh, accelerated. And so solutions around how do we solve this um, delivery of uh, products, but also the supply chain, manufacturing, uh, the movement of goods. You know, China's locked down so much. We had uh, a movement of people moving to manufacturing and distribution hubs in different ways. And a lot of different companies started looking at warehousing solutions, last mile solutions. How do I get to the 
the, the, the far cities in, in different dispersed countries, um, such as India, but I would also think Philippines would be quite similar there too. Uh, and the last but certainly not least was ESG. So we see, we saw quite a few trends around this as well um, in the market. And these trends obviously allude to the fact that, you know, ESG is an important uh, factor for all of us to consider. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, data centers that store data and all of these businesses are all data centric software companies. They all generate huge amounts of data that are stored somewhere that require energy uh, to cool them, huge amounts of energy and cooling. And that cooling of that energy requires power and therefore uh, has a negative impact on the environment. So how companies at the same time grow and do this in an effective way is really important. So ESG solutions are certainly coming up. I work with a lot of data center companies who are asking the same question, telecom companies who are trying to basically do this differently. But on the other side, innovation around you know, uh, new technologies that may help us in terms of the different types of goods and services that, um, the, trend, uh, that the trends are looking at so people may want to purchase. So they're the six key trends that the report covered. I wanted to now talk through some of this and it's a little bit detailed, but it was really fascinating. Um, you know, many of us have heard about the high level technology areas, FinTech, LogTech, HealthTech, PropTech, uh, as mentioned. And at that highest level, um, we kind of understand that these are being disrupted. But what was interesting was we took a layer deeper under that and asked ourselves, so beyond those high level uh, industry tags, we started to look at industry subsectors. And what we asked us, what we started to look at is for each of these emerging giants or each of these companies that were, were of the six and a half thousand companies that we looked at, what were the most common subsector tags that came out? And what were the businesses they were in? So, so one company could be a multiple one of these tags, but the point being was, we just want to get a sense of where private equity and investors were putting their money and where the type of startups that were coming up. And so this is really interesting because it gives you us, it gives all of us a sense of, you know, what are the, what is the trends of those new subsectors coming up? What was super interesting was obviously the first two that you see NFTs really, really stood out uh, surprisingly to me being the absolute number one. Decentralized finance, which again is like a Web3 application. And then you've got electric vehicle charging infrastructure, quantum computing, robotic process automation. A lot of these um, businesses were geared around either generating new opportunities in the market, like a trend, like NFTs, um, transforming and being more efficient in the way things are operating, decentralized finance, or perhaps lending towards the trend around ESG, electric electrification and, and EV charging stations. But as you move down, you'll see varying levels of things such as virtual events. No surprise during COVID, that was, uh, that was something a, a lot of companies were looking at that. Um, you go further down, you see AI powered uh, drug discovery. Uh, you see sustainable packaging, ESG, sustainable fashion, blockchain, real estate, decentralized autonomous um, organizations. A lot of Web3 technologies and decentralization of platforms. So as you all know, the Web2, the Web3 is a transformation taking place. And basically what's happening is that the way that information is being now distributed, created by users and being managed outside of a core central st structure, but a more decentralized structure using technologies like blockchain has driven efficiencies and ways to operate. I'll give you a quick example around what this looks like. So we're hearing a lot about embedded banking. So when you go online and you want to buy an iPad and it costs you $1,000, if you have another button there in the widget that you press and say, I'll, I'll pay via installments over three months. And that widget is a banking widget, a decentralized finance payments widget that a telco could operate, electronic store could embed. And they can embed that, they could embed insurance products, so this embedded micro element of a transaction really starts to then invade the way that we transact across all products and services. And that goes from anything from health applications, insurance, and we're seeing this convergence and crossover, crossing over of different sectors and industries because of what technology is doing. 
And that really goes back to the left-hand side where it says, as mentioned before, 80% of all the companies were software platform based. And just like as mentioned, like the grabs of this world are cutting across all sectors. That's the same now with technology. And the opportunity is really just coming down to, can someone create something that disrupts a business in the country that you operate at scale with a low friction and high velocity way of engaging something that happens super quick at the press of a button and embedded in an application or a, a, a the supply chain flow or a, com, or a commercial flow that enables something to do something differently. So this is what we were seeing in the market and, and it's really, really quite interesting. So many of you may be wondering, so, um, you know, why Philippines uh, doesn't have enough uh, so emerging giants? What could you be doing differently? How do we work with governments and startups to do this? Well, we highlighted some of the key characteristics and we asked um, uh, actually unicorn companies as well as the startup companies, what makes them different? And what are the type of things that they would look for uh, in both hiring and building an organization of the future? So number one was superior technology and or technical knowledge. So you heard from Darius just now, he wasn't in real estate. Right, and he was in the space of technology and he understood that type of space. So what we're seeing is that tech founders are really, really important. Understanding how to use technology to, to make changes in the way that technology perhaps doesn't exist very efficiently today. Expert knowledge of local markets and consumer behaviors. Darius said exactly the same thing. He said, I spent most of my time in the market understanding the customer. And so this one size fits all approach, I think is, is gonna to need to be hyper-localized. So when you understand your local market, you understand those opportunities, you understand the behaviors, that's absolutely critical in tying number one and two together to execute on a new business model. Number three was a specialist in supply chain operations and logistics. And, and I would broaden this out to say, a specialist in understanding the flow of the way that business that you're looking at operates, be it real estate as you know, that we talked about earlier today, or be it um, payments or finance or farming, it could be anything. And when you start to see how the first two items can help improve that flow of business or the flow of supply chain or the flow of logistics, those are the things that we're starting to see as opportunities for emerging giants to grow and also capitalize on. Agile business modeling. So the ability to move quick and fast, start small and grow and continue to reinvent and create new ways of working. So this is absolutely critical because the ability for a business to reinvent and redefine is absolutely key. So, so again, one business won't be the same in six, 12, 24 months but feedback from the customers, the changing environment, all those things need to be, to be uh, in, um, in the, integrated back in by an agile approach and then changing the business model to, to, to acclimatize the situation and to your, to your customers. And last but not least, a human-centered culture that attracts and retains top talent. So talent is one of the biggest challenges that everyone has seen. So when you look at those areas above, a lot of that comes down to ways of working, uh, outside in thinking, uh, solutioning. Um, one of the things that I've been very, very um, uh, sort of forward thinking or forward uh, about is, um, you know, linear versus lateral thinkers. And, you know, it's like, that, like the artist versus the, the executor. And so you need people who can solve problems, uh, left and right brain thinking. You need creatives that solve problems, not just deliver what you're wanting to do. So if you're in a manufacturing world where you're just doing the same thing over and over again, you don't need creative people. But if you're redesigning everything in your business by the day, by the week, by the month, absorbing new information, building new technology, changing your business models, you need people who can be agile and adapt in that way. And so therefore, the understanding of that human-centered culture, which goes back to understanding your customer and the way you apply those challenges is absolutely key. So with that, I wanted to sort of... Um, uh, sort of pause there and just say thank you to everyone for listening. Um, it's been wonderful uh, uh, speaking to you all today. And I really hope that some of those insights would inspire all of you um, to become an emerging giant and those that serve uh, all the companies around the region really get a better understanding as to what's happening in the region 
and what's happening in the market and, and uh, hopefully give you a bit of sense of, you know, what does it take to become an emerging giant? Uh, back to you. Thank you, Darren. That was very interesting. Thank you for running us through the process and considerations in identifying the emerging giants in the region. Uh, let me now go through uh, to the next speaker. Our third speaker is Mr. Philip An. He is co-founder and CEO of Homebase, a prop tech startup that seeks to democratize home ownership in Southeast Asia by providing an alternative to traditional bank mortgages. Homebase is the first company from, Viet from Vietnam to be backed by startup accelerator Y Combinator and has raised $30 million in equity and debt funding from investors such as Goodwater Capital, Antler, and Vina Capital Ventures. An alumnus of Caltech and Harvard Business School, he previously worked at Goldman Sachs and McKinsey and was named as Forbes 30 Under 30 prize recipient. Let us all welcome Mr. Philip Yan. Hello. Um, let me quickly share my screen so you guys can see what I'm seeing. Oh, can you guys see my screen? Not yet, Philip. Okay. Oh, this is a little bit weird. Hang on. We can see we can see your screen now. Yeah, we're checked. It looks like he dropped off from the call. Uh, we'll just wait a few, maybe a minute, for him to dial back in. Hi Are guys. Sorry. Yes, Philip, we're, we're yeah. yes, we're yes, we're currently we're currently presenting the slides you sent over. Um, can you see it from your end? Yes, I can. I can. Right. Um, actually, I think I can share the screen now. Maybe it's a little bit easier as well. Um, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Yes, fantastic. See your screen. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Yeah, always always have some technical issues, so I appreciate everyone's patience. Sorry, um, sorry, Philip. Is it just me? But uh, I'm seeing the screen, but not the presentation itself. We can see oh. the presentation. Oh, you can. We can't. Uh, it's just the cursor moving around. Sorry. So you guys can see the presentation, or cannot see the presentation? We cannot see it yet. Oh, you cannot see the cannot. presentation. Okay. Let me see if I can drag it to the screen. There. That's it. Does this work? That's it, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. All right. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for uh, bearing with me. But um, yeah. So um, if everyone can see the screen, I'm really glad to be here. Um, as uh, you know, and and thank you guys so much for the kind introduction. So my name is um, Philip Ann. I'm the co-founder and CEO of this company called Homebase. And um, as Darius uh, alluded to, we are a real estate financing company um, focused on Vietnam. And our mission here at Homebase is to actualize each and every uh, individual stream of homeownership uh, across Southeast Asia. So today in my presentation, um, hopefully I'll be covering a little bit more about uh, the real estate market, specifically in Vietnam, but also maybe some general market nuances and trends that we see across Southeast Asia. Hopefully some of these problems and issues that we are solving and we are tackling will be very empathetic to that of the Philippines and in other markets as well. Um, I'll also cover a little bit more about our company and our developmental history in terms of what we've been able to do. Um, and then lastly, about 
um, who we serve. So in terms of our target demographic, the customers that we serve, and hopefully some of these trends and some of these patterns will not be only be applicable to Vietnam, but also broader across Southeast Asia and specifically in the Philippines as well. Um, so more relevant for you guys. Um, and of course, I'll be answering questions at the very end. So definitely let me know if there's anything that pops up that I can help with. Awesome. Um, so just to start, I wanted to start more about, you know, kind of the general problem statement that we at Homebase really, you know, have identified across Southeast Asia. And, you know, this problem is basically that this entire homeownership journey is broken in many, many parts of Southeast Asia, and especially in Vietnam, which is the market that we focus on right now. And when I say broken, what do I mean by that? Well, there's three main dimensions that we refer to. The first is that economic conditions across much of Southeast Asia are a little bit unfavorable. What you have seen in the past several years is that home prices just have skyrocketed through the roof. Because real estate is such an attractive asset class across Singapore and many other countries, many, many investors will invest in real estate. And this caused um, a lot of really rapid growth. So for example, in Vietnam, in the past several years, the average year-on-year -year growth rate has been around 17% every single year. And fundamentally, what this causes is that there's a very significant ratio of the home price to income ratio. Um, in Southeast Asia, the average ratio is around 22.6. If you compare it to a more mature market like the U.S., which is way lower, around 3.5, and somewhere like the U.K., like London, it rounds 9.8. And fundamentally, this isn't necessarily because property prices are so high. It also just could refer to that incomes are a little bit lower in Southeast Asia, and especially in these developing emerging market countries. What we also see is that traditional financing solutions, uh, most you know, notably like banks or other financial institutions, are sometimes very inaccessible to the majority of the audience. Um, and you know, to this to this point, it, it's not because banks are you know really doing bad or anything like that. It's also just because of the fundamental infrastructure that we see here in Southeast Asia is quite lacking. For example, there's no credit scoring system, or it's very hard to process mortgages. And what we see here in Vietnam is that that means that there's a really high deposit percentage that customers usually would have to put in upwards of 40% um, before someone gets in mortgage. And for banks at traditional, um, mortgage at traditional banks, there's a very high rejection rate as well. Over 95% of mortgages could be rejected, meaning that it's very hard for consumers to be able to get a loan. Um, these issues are coupled with a very undeveloped real estate market. In Vietnam right now, over 70% of transactions are still done in cash. And with no licensing or certification system, it's very easy to be scammed and have a very opaque market with really no or little market regulation. In regards to the liquidation of an asset. So, you know, if you're a financial uh, institution and you want to liquidate an asset, it's a very long and insufficient process. Right now, it takes an average of over six months in Vietnam to be able to sell a property. And 80% of real estate agents, despite there being many, only sell one or less properties every single year. And all of these issues are very compounded by a very difficult home ownership journey for a majority of the audience. In Vietnam alone, it takes around 22 years for the average Vietnamese citizen to save up for their first home. If you compare that with more developed markets, it's only 15 years in the US, 10 years in the UK, and in Hong Kong, which you know, notably, most notably is a very, very expensive market, it's around 12 years alone. Um, I'm not exactly sure about the data in the Philippines, but you know, it's very basically the message is that it's very difficult for many people to be able to you know, buy and afford their dream home. And that's exactly the issue space that you know, home base for free, we as a company, we play in. So a little bit more about us as a company and our company history and our development. Um, so actually Homebase, we were founded in 2019 in Singapore. Um, so it was a co-founder and I, we actually you know, kind of went around to real consumers and we talked to them, right? And we said, hey, what are the most poignant problems? What are the most painful problems that you guys face in your daily lives? And across the board, one of the most common responses that we received from millennials and young people was this concept of being able to own a home and being able to access financing to own a home. So we started with this real problem and decided to find, hey, is there a solution that we could do to implement this and help people be able to own their dream homes? So soon after we were founded, we were able to raise an institutional round of funding from some venture capital funds like Antler and Iterative. And we soon launched operations in Ho Chi Minh City, which was our first office. 
In 2020, we we're able to scale the company, grow, expand our operations, and raise another round of funding from more local VCs, like Mina Capital Ventures, and also VCs from Singapore. And we we're able to garner some awards, including one of the top 50 prop tech companies in the world. In 2021, we we're able to be admitted to um, a really prestigious accelerator called Y Combinator in the United States. And we we're able to then scale our impact even more and close a, a funding round of around $30 million. Um, from leading global investors from the US, Singapore, and Europe. And finally, this brings us to 2022. Despite the impact of COVID, um, today, you know, we've been able to operate across 20 cities in Vietnam and have officially opened a second office in Da Nang, um, which is another city in Vietnam. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, be, being, you know, in the theme of the other talk, we're able to uh, be recognized as uh, part of the 10 emerging giants in Vietnam by HSBC and KPMG as well. So in regards to what we do at Homebase, um, now that you know a little bit more about history, I'll talk a little bit more about how we operate as a business model. So as a consumer, sometimes, you know, people actually want to come to us and they actually want to finance their dream home. So how does it actually work? So first they would come to us and maybe they would propose a specific property that they would do. We have an internal valuation team and internal appraisal team that actually investigates the property and make sure that it's fully safe, not only for the customer, but also for the company and for the investors that are backing us. After we agree to actually proceed with the property, the customer would actually put in an initial deposit of around 20% of this property value. After they put in the initial deposit every single month, um, you know, Homebase would actually first go out and buy the property under our name. And every single month, the customer would pay a monthly deposit to build up equity and ownership in the property over a single uh, uh, period of time. And finally, once the customer wants to fully buy out the property or once the customer wants to sell the property, we actually will transfer the property back to the customer or to the new buyer of their choosing as well. So very simple business model, and this is how it works. And many people ask us initially in our development, hey, like, how did you guys come up with this business model? Was this a very new uh, model? And one of the really kind of interesting trends and learnings that we saw throughout our developmental journey is that there's a lot of opportunity for disruption across Southeast Asia, not by coming up with completely new models, but because there's many established models in more mature markets in the world, for example, like the United States, like in Europe, to be able to be implemented in Southeast Asia and really make an impact in these new emerging markets. For us, we are very inspired by a company called Divi Homes. Um, so this is the company Divi Homes right here. And these pioneered this model called Rent to Own. While they started only in 2018, they're worth around $3 billion and have seen very exponential growth. And we hope really that we can also replicate their success as well. Um, however, we also see that there's a lot of other emerging markets across or some states that you know have been quite successful as well. So for example, Home Partners of America has been bought by a private equity fund. And there's a company called Open Door, which also does um, iBuying, so instant liquidity of property that has been quite successful in the United States as well. And I think for us, one of the key um, differentiators of success and why we've been able to scale um, you know, quite rapidly in Vietnam and across Southeast Asia for us is that many of the pioneers of these models in these parts of the world have been very instrumental in helping us set up the company and scale and give us some really good advice. And what we've seen across the board is that, you know, this is not only true in prop tech or real estate, but also in many of the other companies, for example, you know, in companies like Grab or Shopee or other uh, innovative companies across Southeast Asia as well. Next, I'll talk a little bit deeper about at Homebase, who is our target customer and who do we actually serve? So the broad category of customers that we actually serve are providing services to those individuals who cannot access traditional mortgages because of either restrictions on lending or because of other factors that prevent them from being able to get financing. So there's two main buckets that we see that have potential in the market. In terms of the local demographic that we serve, it could be business owners, they could be good economy workers, salespeople, people don't have stable income, or people who cannot prove their income to qualify for traditional mortgage. However, at Homebase, we also serve a lot of foreign investors as well. Um, for example, if you're a foreign investor, maybe from Singapore, or even from the Philippines, and want to buy real estate in Vietnam, currently there does not exist any financing solutions in the market. But what we also found as you know, we have scaled the business and served many customers is that 
this is actually quite diverse in regards to the customers that we actually serve. As you can see on the bottom you know, left kind of chart, there's actually a very, very big diversity of professions, of um, industries that people come from. And on the right, you can see that there's a mix between different nationalities, between different locations of properties, and even different income brackets from you know, people who have very low income and also people who have very high income, earning above 200K USD every single year. But overall, what we also see from this kind of learning is that um, because there's no really one specific you know, bracket or information, real estate financing as a sector just really remains a really huge opportunity because the need of these customers to um, secure financing is actually really, really much across the board. Um, and hopefully this is a lesson that you know, we can kind of take away, not only in Vietnam, but maybe in other markets across Southeast Asia as well. And finally, I'll talk a little bit more about our products and the customer profiles that we served into these products. At Homebase, we started with this one product and what we call is buy with installment, which is the model that I just went over. Um, these customers are aspiring home buyers or investors. They could be both locals or they could be foreigners, um, maybe middle-aged uh, careers and then middle income. And these people just want to buy a home. So this is our first product that we served and basically very intuitive where you know we're providing another way for them to be able to get financing and buy and dream, live in their dream home. But one of the really big challenges that many companies had during the past year was obviously the effect of COVID-19. And you know what we saw is that in a COVID environment where everyone is very risk averse and doesn't necessarily want to buy or invest in new properties, the demand for this product really has changed. And what you know, these kind of important shifts in the market have taught us is that it's very important to be flexible and constantly innovate on what value you drive and deliver to customers. So during this really tough time, we went back to the market, we talked to our customers when we asked them, what is it that you actually guys need in this kind of uh, you know, time period, this difficult time period? And this actually led us to innovate and you know, do a second product, which now we call Unlock Equity. And for a lot of these customers, maybe they already have an existing house or they already have an existing business. And what they need is actually short-term financing that is collateralized or backed by the asset in that property. So what we allow them to do is, you know, allow them to gain access to wealth in a very illiquid asset traditionally, which is, you know, that the, the equity built in your home. And you know, using the very similar model, we allow them to be able to, be able to access short-term financing so that they can temporarily pay off their student loans, they can support their children or support their other businesses as well. And what we notice is that you know, constantly the market will change, especially in a market like Southeast Asia. So you know, in the future, there might be additional products or additional services that we do launch. So overall, um, this is a really fast introduction in terms of home base and what we do as a company. Um, hopefully it's helpful, but I'm definitely happy to answer more questions on what we do. And hopefully some of the learnings can be translated to the Philippines as well. Um, so thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. That was great, Philip. Uh, thank you for sharing your company and your business model and giving a very insightful presentation. Uh, let me now go introduce our panelists for this morning. Our panelist is Dean Roberto Martin Gala. Dr. Robbie Galang is the Dean of the John Gokmui School of Management in Ateneo de Manila University. He was formerly a Senior Private Sector Specialist for the World Bank. At the World Bank, his responsibilities revolved around projects to foster competition, enhance productivity, improve business, regulations, facilitate trade, and promote innovation in support of private sector development in countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. Prior to joining the World Bank Group, Robbie has had more than a decade of international experience in the analysis of strategic and regulatory issues for private corporations. He was an assistant professor of business strategy at, Ateneo de, at the Ateneo de Manila University and the Asian Institute of Management, where he conducted research on the impact of government institutional inefficiencies on firm performance. He completed his PhD in management from the IESE Business School, his MSc in Development Economics from Oxford University, and his AB in Communications from the Ateneo de Manila University, where he was the class valedictorian. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Roberto Martin Gala. Thank you, everyone. Um, 
do you mind sharing my slides or should I do it from my uh, my computer? Do you have a copy of the slides? But in any case, thank you for Phoenix for allowing me to present this morning um, because I think this is an area that is uh, quite a challenge uh, for everyone, um, especially here in the Philippines, so especially with the KPMG report as to how we've seen a lot of the emerging uh, giants come from our neighbors, uh, including the giants that have been created by Philip and Darius. No, uh, and so we at the academe uh, are quite challenged by this, especially uh, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, we're really seeing a need uh, to really help uh, our students uh, retool because a lot of these uh, firms, including the one uh, Philip was describing earlier, actually just came from two or three years ago. And so we really need to retool to accelerate all of our innovation support programs. Uh, and this is a challenge, not just for us here at the academy, but I feel it's a challenge for us as a country. Uh, next slide, please. And so what Ateneo de Manila is doing uh, is really trying to really push and modify our students' uh, you know, access and, uh, and learning across our different programs. No? So in essence, traditionally, we've had five undergraduate programs that really push uh, for entrepreneurship. No? These include our flagship course on BS management and BS management owners, and our more recently created programs on IT entrepreneurship and restaurant entrepreneurship, as well as, of course, our management with applied chemistry. So these, uh, these programs are designed to really turn our students into entrepreneurs. But over time, the scale of these enterprises have gone from you know, your, your general retail, as well as, you know, SME, SME type uh, operations, no? So companies that create restaurants or, or apparel or fashion, but now they're more heading towards more tech enabled services, no? Next slide. And so we've been challenged to really come up with different programs to supplement uh, the, the need for, you know, for these kinds of, um, these kinds of firms. So for example, we've created uh, partnerships with entities like Kubo and the Department of Trade and Industry to create boot camps for our students, so exposing them to companies like Microsoft, Accenture, and of course the startups that are created by our alumni, as well as our former, our, our, you know, our, our former faculty, uh, so that they can understand that this kind of path going forward is something that is also open to them. Right, and that they also are given the tools and access to the kinds of uh, resources that they will need to really scale up and create these disruptive uh, business models of the future. Next slide. Um, so we've also had to upgrade the accelerator that we've had uh, in-house. Uh, what we've done to that extent is to really partner with more uh, Entities, no, for example, Kaya Founders, uh, which is a uh, venture capital uh, based in the Philippines, is now our institutional partner so that we get exposed to both their network and their expertise. Uh, Ateneo is also proud to be the first academic partner of Sinigang Valley, uh, the largest uh, agglomeration of startups here in the Philippines. No, We're also partnering with our LGU to create a startup grant so that our students get access to, you know, to funding that is provided by the local government, as well as private companies like Accenture and of course, we've mentioned Kubo and the Department of Science and Technology. You know? See, these are both private and public entities that provide a lot of technical support to our students, as well as to our, you know, our future startups. Next slide, please. And the challenge for us really is that, especially as we wake up from this pandemic, is that a lot of the things that we've been teaching in the past is not as uh, relevant to the future companies that are coming out, right? So we've, of course, taught many of our students the basics of finance, the basics of marketing, but they're now being more uh, designed towards venture capital, digital marketing. We need to have them more savvy around issues about data analysis, data privacy, and of course, ESG, you know, which was mentioned by Darius earlier. These are important trends that we feel have very strong legs, and therefore it's a challenge for us to understand how these things work. No, so for example, uh, in the past couple of months that I've joined Ateneo, I've had to fully immerse myself in the venture capital world, understand issues around seed capital, you know, uh, safes, uh, venture funding, mark product market fit, and all of these different, you know, issues that a traditional finance corporation may not be as uh, as aware of, right? And so it's a really a strong challenge for us to 
to retool not just our students and our curriculum, but also, of course, us as faculty, you know, to be able to really appreciate the digital world that the Philippines has become. Uh, next slide. And we're also happy to indicate that you know the, the whole university is moving, not just the John Gokwe School of Management. No, so we've actually opened an intellectual property office, who really is built on the university level to provide commercialization and business incubation support, uh, and also of course ideation and uh, IP protection and education. No, next slide. And uh, in the short time that this has been put up, you know we've had very strong relationships with the. Uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce, with the Inventor Society, uh, with Impact Ventures, as well as, of course, the Intellectual Property Office, because we feel that, you know, none of these can operate in a vacuum. There is a larger and larger community of, of resources that our startup community has access to, and really want Ateneo to become a landing page for as many startups, not just those that are coming through our students, as well as the inventors of our faculty, but also, of course, our alumni and even non-Ateneo uh, related uh, Filipinos that might want to start their own, you know, scalable venture, their disruptive business models, but don't know where to start. No, so we're hoping that they come to us. We may not be the one to solve all their problems, but with the network that we are slowly building, uh, we hope to put them in the right direction and feed them to the correct incubators, uh, venture builders, and all the, you know, the angel investors that may be more aligned with what they're trying to do, and of course, be able to help them scale. So I think I, I just wanted to end, uh, you know, this uh, discussion or start this discussion with this challenge. You know that uh, us at the academe, we really have to accelerate our ability to support, uh, you know, companies like Philip uh, and of course Darius, you know, so that we can provide them with uh, the talent that they need and that the skills of the future, uh, you know, actually are needed today in the Philippines. So thank you very much for uh, inviting us in. Maybe let me throw the floor over back to Mike uh, so that we can have you know, our panel discussion. Well, thank you very much for that uh, perspective, Dean Robbie. Um, well, Mike is our moderator for this morning's panel discussion. So Mike, and then we will welcome back uh, to the virtual floor, Darren and Philip. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Jing. Good morning. Um, so if if I may, if I may ask, so Darren and Philip, no, to likewise join us. All right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dean Robbie. Actually, uh, based on the discussions by both Darius and by Philip, it struck me that it really, at the end of the day, their businesses are trying to solve a specific problem statement, right? Uh, both uh, presenters, this one of their first uh, slides revolved around what the problems, problem or problems were. So um, in terms of preparing a business, Philip, in your case, what was it a, a long discussion on which specific issue or problem that your company wanted to solve? Or uh, maybe you can describe uh, that initial stage for us. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. And I think it's something that um, a lot of businesses struggle with in the very beginning. So for us, we started with a philosophy of honestly trying to solve a problem that uh, we were very familiar with, like me and my co-founder. And, you know, for my co-founder, he had lived in Vietnam for quite a long time and he actually had wanted to buy a home. And so he actually personally went through this process of trying to buy a home, trying to get financing because property prices are very high. He was an entrepreneur before he had very unstable income. And he honestly saw kind of and experienced the pain points about how difficult it was to be able to secure that financing and get a solution for himself. So, you know, he had this kind of um, intuition, right, that maybe other people in the market also face this very similar problem and also experience this pain points. And I guess our, you know, kind of journey of discovering, you know, is this actually a common problem or is this something that's very unique was just through talking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of customers. And it's something that we actually even do today um, because uh, for, for us, you know, we're, we're always driving towards this concept of product market fit, which is, you know, making sure that your customers, whatever solution that you do really, really love you. So every single feature that we launch, every single kind of iteration or tweak in the product is always going to be try to be, you know, very data driven, driven by the customer feedback and letting the customer take you 
on where, where, what are the problems that they want to solve. So that's the process that we kind of uh, followed as we, as, we, as we were following that initial uh, company st uh, startup step. All right. And then another item, Philip. So you mentioned that, uh, so primarily you're serving the Vietnamese right, uh, yes. market, but you actually were formed in Singapore. So uh, maybe can you, because the issue now is, I'd like to think that it's easy to identify relatively easy to identify problems right it, it's what you it's the execution part what next right in your case you were very successful from problem statement all the way following it through into actually forming a company uh to where you are now right so uh, i'm interested to hear what do you think were the enabling factors uh you, you could have chosen to start that company anywhere in the world, right? You educated in Caltech, Harvard Business School. You could have chosen to set that up in, in the US, maybe Europe, I don't know. But you chose to set it up in Singapore. So what were the, you know, uh, I guess, factors that contributed to it uh, being realized? If you can share some things with us. Thank you. Yeah, that's definitely a great question. Um, I think... In retrospect, it's very easy to very, you know, connect the dots and say everything is very successful. But, you know, like Darius said, the entrepreneur and founder journey is very messy. And even for us, we made a ton of mistakes and we still make a lot of mistakes. And, you know, obviously we don't present these mistakes on the slides because it doesn't look as good. Right. Um, but we still make a lot of mistakes. And, you know, it's something that always happens for every single company. Um, I will say that you know, for myself, I'm mainly from the United States. I mainly grew up there and was educated there and had had uh, worked there most of my professional career. Um, but I, you know, I, I really believe and I still have a very strong conviction that right now, Southeast Asia is the place to be in regards to where the opportunity really is. And, you know, for me, Singapore was one of the stepping stones of being able to access the market. But, you know, for me, I'm, I'm very convinced about Southeast Asia. And it, it's something that even at, you know, a place like Harvard Business School, where I tell, you know, some of the students or some of the peers there that, you know, if they're from Philippines or they're from Indonesia, they should actually move back and start a company there. Because I really believe that there's few times in history where you see, you know, a region of 600, 700 million people, um, a very vibrant emerging middle class, a very young technology for digitally enabled middle class coming to fruition. Um, maybe the next opportunity is in Africa. It may be in five or 10 years from now. But I, I really believe that uh, this decade and this century right now is Southeast Asia's time. And, you know, much like the, the Vietnam, I, I really believe that, you know, even in, in, in the Philippines, right, you have this really uh, crucial opportunity where, the, you know, there's a lot of industries, a lot of sectors that are really ripe for disruption, where if young entrepreneurs, you know, uh, with a lot of technology, with the right attitude, can really make a huge difference and, you know, create really astounding companies. I think right now we're beginning to see some of the earlier companies, maybe from five to 10 years ago, be very successful, right? Um, you see companies like Grab, which just did a SPAC. You see companies like Gojek or Tokopedia or Traveloka mm -hmm. um, raising Series D, Series E rounds. And, you know, in the next several years, I bet that there will be a ton of companies from the Philippines, maybe like Gcash or some of the other unicorns that are emerging from the Philippines and, and from Vietnam um, be, be very emerging, right? So it was kind of that personal thesis that, you know, I really believe that if you come to the right region at the right time and, you know, you're resourceful enough, you're ambitious enough that you can actually build a very, um, you know, kind of groundbreaking industry defining company. And so for me, that's kind of the personal journey that I, I took um, to, to, to come to Southeast Asia. All right. Thank you, Philip. And then if I may connect that to one of the slides presented by Dean Robbie, because I agree with what Philip mentioned, uh, there are a lot of sectors that are ripe for disruption, but again, there are a lot of hindrances, right, or, or stumbling blocks that will prevent actual disruption from happening. Uh, Dean, Robbie, you mentioned that, and I'd like to think that it's about maybe uh, alliances tying up with enabling organizations or agencies. I recall in one of your slides, uh, you, the school itself, the university itself, you're tying up, right, with DTI and all other partners and even private companies. Maybe can you 
expound on the thought process? Well, this thought process actually started when I came from the World Bank, because if you noted over the past uh, few years, the government actually passed a number of laws, including the Innovative Startup Act, no? which uh, basically creates a pool of funds that is designed to be invested in startups. No, um, so there's funds now with the Department of Trade and Industry. There's funds now from the Department of ICT. And so when I came back to the academia, I realized that while some of these relationships are built already, so Ateneo already had a partnership with the Department of Science and Technology, it didn't cut across across the different departments. And then starting with that, you also started looking at the other partnerships that could be created, no? for example, with uh with actual vcs themselves because as philip mentioned no, i think uh, this is really our time to shine a lot of the angel investors and venture capital that have looked at singapore that have seen the growth in indonesia and malaysia are also looking now into the philippines and vietnam primarily because you know a lot of the markets here are more ripe for disruption Right. And so a lot of the work that has already been created by Gojek and Tokopedia uh, can likely also happen here. So they're really scouring the, the region. Uh, we feel that there's a lot more funding looking for. So basically the pipeline for investable businesses is smaller than the amount of uh, people looking based funds that are coming through. And therefore, it's really an opportune time for startups to come and develop. But again, they can't do that by themselves. It's best that they partner. That's why we like these entities like Sinigang Valley, uh, which is basically a community that brings together, you know, they're based in Poblacion. Uh, it's, it brings together um, the VCs, the angels, the would-be startups and the actual startups so that they help each other, right? They provide mentorships, they provide uh, talent, uh, they provide internships, they provide you know, even just throwing business ideas around, right? So. Joining these meetings, you really feel the, the urgency as well as the vibrancy of our startup community, which again, just to echo uh, what, what Philip said, right? It, I think uh, we're ripe for an explosion in startups and you're gonna see that really explode from the Philippines in the next couple of years. And we're happy that Ateneo to play a part in that. And of course we invite Phoenix to help us, right? So that we can really you know, create the, the financing and the mentorship systems that will really help these startups go to become the next emerging uh, you know, giants. All right, uh, thank you, Dean Robbie. And then Darren, uh, if I may ask, so given you know, edu educated in Australia and then most of your uh, working life, correct me if I'm wrong now, is spent in Singapore and as well as the other modern countries in Asia Pacific. Um, I don't mean to pop the balloon no, of the Philippines, but obviously um, we, we're trying to, you know, um, an explosion of startups, but the but it will always be a competition, right? So across uh, the countries in Asia Pacific. And some countries will be more attractive for investors relative to others. So uh, my question there is similar to what I asked Philip. Uh, what what so similar to uh, instead of mentioning it as an enabling environment, what do you think makes a country more attractive, specific yeah. to the new economy for investors? Well, I think um, if I look at Philippines, what what you have going for it is uh, pr primarily very strong English speaking background, huge population, um, and and a and a, and a I would say a culture that is, is is very positive in an outlook in terms of what they can do. So I, I actually see that there's a lot of opportunity uh, in that market. If I look at also the background of say farming and, and different types of um, industries that the Philippines you know have, there are a lot of opportunities there to, to transform and, and do things differently in the Philippines. Um, and along with the governments and, and what we're hearing around the startup ecosystem and investments, I, I absolutely think that there are uh, opportunities for them. And uh, what I would say to, to the Philippines as a nation is really looking at, you know, earlier we've been talking a lot around solving problems, like identifying, you know, key local based areas that at scale with technology, you could really make a big, big difference, uh, make things lives better, uh, improve the efficiency, uh, democratize the way things work, um, communicate and drive efficiencies around productivity, 
Uh, all of those areas, I, I'm absolutely sure there will be investors willing to, to invest. It, it really comes down to that incubator system, the problem solving mindset and, and really enabling the people. So I think it, it's, a, it, it's an amazing um, you know, opportunity for everyone to really look into. And I would really highly encourage it. All right. Thank you for those nice words, uh, Darren. And then maybe if we stay with you, uh, one of your last slides would be in relation to the characteristics of emerging giants. And then one of the, well, the first box there would be in relation to superior technology and our technical knowledge. Uh, and using as an example, our two founders, two uh, CXOs no, um, in the lineup, they were educated in the U.S., right? Stanford, Darius, and then Caltech and uh, HBS for Philip. Um, I'm not sure if you have that visibility, but at least for the other emerging giants in the list, uh, were, were they primarily uh, educated uh, in, in the U.S. or maybe some of them were uh, based here in any of the engineering or science universities in Asia? Yeah. Well, well, let me first comment on the on the the schools and the education. I think there's illustrious schools out there, and and I'm uh, not one of those uh, alumni. But but having said that, I really respect um, the talent that comes out of those best um, universities around the world. It it is truly amazing. Having said that, and working with you know the digital divide, ADB, World Bank, um, you see nations and what they've developed. If you look back 20 years ago and what outsourcing did for India as a GDP contributor, that, that skill set is very different to data science and data engineering. Yeah. It's, it's night and day. And if you really think about investment of a nation and the ability to self-learn, I mean, you can jump online on Coursera and teach yourself coding from Google and actually become an engineer. So you don't need, and what I'm saying is that you don't need to be or ha be, be lucky enough to be able to go to one of the best schools. If you're willing to learn and able to put some effort into it, uh, absolutely you can do that. And I, and, I, and I sort of point out Vietnam as a, as a country where I see this coming up a lot. Um, if you actually then think about your skill, it's transferable because a lot of coding is done offshore. So if, if people on this call think, well, I can't become digital literate, I, I cannot get into that school, well, I would encourage everyone to actually just jump online and, and do one of those courses that, you know, say Google offers. Because if you can code on Google or Amazon or Microsoft or any of these hyperscalers, spin up and create a business, that ability to disrupt is really in your own hands. So I, I, would, I would sort of, flip it the other way and say, actually, there is there are huge opportunities in there. And there are opportunities for countries to almost leapfrog others with mm -hmm. digital skills and actually become a digital contributor in GDP versus perhaps rely on the traditional ways of contribution, such as exports of farming. You could be a net exporter of digital capabilities. So um, I, would, I would encourage everyone to really put, you know, take that responsibility in yourself and, and do it yourself. It, it's, um, it, it, it is something that is accessible to everyone. All right. Thank you, Darren, for those encouraging words. Um, if I may go back to Philip. So uh, given no, that you do have a solid uh, engineering and science background. So my question is, uh, we know how competitive it is, right? Uh, in terms of uh, making sure that you're on the cutting edge of technology, being a tech company. So how much time or how much effort is the company spending trying to make sure that you're always on the cutting edge of knowledge, right? Uh, you're trying to avoid being surprised. Suddenly, there's a quote-unquote home base 3.0, you know, skipping 2.0, and, and you'll be caught flat-footed. No? So how is it for a tech company to, in order to try to avoid uh, that kind of a situation. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I think it's a good question for sure. Um, I think, you know, for us, one of the ways that 
we want to differentiate itself as, you know, as we build and scale our businesses is to build a business with a competitive moat. And fundamentally what that means is that we want to have some factors, right, that make it hard for maybe other entrants in the markets to uh, compete or as you get bigger and bigger that you have differentiation, differentiation with whether you add more value to customers or you can drive down the cost of capital, whatever it is that makes your business uh, more and more competitive over time. Um, I think out of all of those things, there's many important kind of competitive modes that we build. For example, one for us, because we do, you know, um, we play in this, this area of real estate financing is, is access to capital. Another one could be something like technology um, and, you know, making sure that your customer experience is so streamlined, so easy to use so that customers can just use your solution and, you know, uh, have the trust and reputation in the market to choose you over a new entrant. Um, I will say though that, um, you know, I think for some type of businesses, for example, maybe a more software oriented business that isn't in the real world, um, something like data and technology is important. But um, you know, for us uh, as you know, a real estate uh, company in a very emerging market, sometimes there isn't as much access to data or for example, an ability to analyze the data as we like, right? As somewhere like the US because things are very opaque, not as transparent. Um, so in those cases, we have to find other ways to be able to build that competitive moat and uh, make sure we're differentiated. But I think you bring up a really great point in the sense that, you know, regardless of where the innovation is coming from, it always has to stem back to the talent and the people on your team. Um, we really believe mm -hmm. that sometimes it's not about you know, having the best technology, you don't necessarily need to use, you know, 3D printing and AI and all of these buzzwords, right, to make yeah. a really great company. But if you have really great people, um, whether, you know, they know this technical expertise or not, right, but they can innovate, they can, you know, find very creative ways around problems, they, you know, are very ambitious, they push the boundaries of things, we can always find solutions, right. And, you know, for us, that's probably the most important attitude and the talent that we need to have. All right. And then, Philip, uh, a short follow-up. So in terms of uh, gathering the knowledge, um, so naturally, the, all of the required knowledge cannot be sourced from people that you'll successfully recruit, right? So therefore, the need for partnerships <clears throat> or alliances with uh, third parties, with other companies. Uh, what sort of expertise uh, do you find most value-adding for your line of work, something that that is not necessarily within uh, or being possessed by any of your employees. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a ton. So in terms of alliances and you know and, and third parties and stuff, you know, we as a company, because real estate is a very big ecosystem, there's a lot of uh, players, right? Whether it be from real estate developers, in which case some of our, our customers will buy the properties from, or even real estate agents, right? Because our customers sometimes need uh, partnerships or ability to be actually find and source the properties that we ultimately will finance. Um, we also have a lot of kind of broad ecosystem partners, in which case we uh, work with them. And part of the reason is also not necessarily just because, hey, um, you know, it's not necessarily because we don't have the capability to build it, but as a business, especially as a startup, um, in the beginning, it's very important to focus on one business mm -hmm. line or one sector or one specific thing and do that very, very well before you develop, you know, a kind of cross-platform thing um, because it, you know, takes a lot of effort and mental capacity to be able to develop everything at the same time. So for us, you know, it's very, it's being very intentional about this is the part of the value chain. This is part of the ecosystem that we really want to specialize in, that we really want to differentiate ourselves and be very good at, and then outsourcing the other parts that you know maybe our channel partners or other ecosystem partners uh, can 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 kind of kind of do. Um, and then within the expertise, um, you know, maybe the people that we do hire, the talent that we bring on may not have that existing team. Um, unlike the U.S., where it's a little bit more structured, um, yeah. there's a lot of companies that, you know, for example, have that product management skill set or have the software engineering skill set that is needed. Um, sometimes we just have to train in-house. So, you know, we'll have different kind of um, training programs. We'll have different kind of boot camps. 
we'll even have um, different kind of like management and leadership trainings because some of the managers that we have, um, maybe they manage in a different style because they're working at very big companies. But when you're running a startup, you know, it's very non-traditional. It's actually very unique the way that you manage your employees, the way that you design incentives. Um, you know, we try to avoid politics. We try to be very transparent and it's very groundbreaking for a lot of people. So we even have to kind of reset some of these training and these kind of expectations as well. So basically it's a combination of, you know, outsourcing, maybe for other functions or ecosystem things that we don't necessarily want to focus on for now, but also, you know, internally developing the capabilities, skill sets, training programs, L&D programs that we need so that make, uh, to make our employees very successful. All right. Uh, thank you, Philip. And then to remind our participants and audience members, feel free to post questions uh, during our panel discussion. Um, and then if I may go back to Dean Robbie. So we we totally understand how challenging it is. I mean, someone like Homebase, they're only three years old. Or did I count it correctly, Philip? 2019, right? So de definitely, it, it's not, you don't necessarily get to course correct <laughs> that quickly. No? An institution as established and as well-known as, uh, as the Ateneo. So um, I, I'll just ask the question raised by our co-chair, Amig. So... In so in this case, since we're all, we're already in a, in an open discussion, uh, in what areas do you think can Phoenix help in the effort to improve the landscape in the Philippines? Uh, we'd like to think that uh, through your leadership, things are already moving, no? at least uh, within your uh, area of influence. And maybe uh, you can describe to us some of the efforts you have uh, in your school, and then branch out from there. We'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you, Mike. No, but at first, let me talk about the challenge you raised earlier as to why many of the startups uh, that founders actually are educated abroad and not locally. You know? And I think that's a personal challenge to us uh, because I think uh, traditionally, you know, we've basically produced students who have sought and their dream is to have the the, the nice corporate jobs, you no, know, primarily, you know, graduate from our university and go to basically the Phoenix sponsors, you no, know, like yeah. Shell, All Home, uh, Ayala Land. I can go through your list of sponsors just to make them, uh, you know, appreciative of their their sponsorship. Uh, but in essence, no. Uh, but since the pandemic, I know this is kind of a broken record. Um, there's really been a sea change, especially among our students that are coming into our program. They are really digital natives. Uh, I think their idea now is to no longer pursue a traditional career, but to really create and make a difference and disrupt. And the best way to do that is to either start and found a startup or join you know, the startups like what Philip uh, has. No? Because I think uh, they're really now digital natives. Um, in fact, we have start student startups that are operating in in Ateneo right now. And even some of our, let's say, sophomore or junior students, they actually intern with the senior students that are running these small startups. No? So you can imagine now there's this tremendous sea change. They now, as Philip mentioned, though, they do their Coursera, they do the studies on coding. Like what Darren said, no, they don't really just focus on what we teach in their classroom, but they do their own self-study because all of these resources are now available to everyone. So where Phoenix can really help no, is that while we can produce this, the skill set and we can really showcase the, this new career path for them, uh, but what we really want is that, that they re we need help in ideation and problem finding really and is. problem solving because uh, the great startups are really not based on a good tech, but they're really based on finding a pain point that you know, that they have found a solution to. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, living in the Philippines, the good news is that there's so many pain points. Just <laughs> doing anything here, making a payment, going to a bank, you know, buying groceries, they're all very painful. Traveling uh, from point and, A to point B. Traveling from point A to point B. There's so many pain points that it's easy to find. So where Phoenix can help is that, you know, you have so many members. Uh, and what we want is to create these partnerships. We found that in Singapore, many of the uh, the schools have long-term partnerships with uh, private companies. We do projects together. You provide us with data sets and our students work on your uh, problem sets. No? They present to you. Uh, so you not only get to see our students, you know, perform and maybe see them uh, you know, uh, see their talent and so that you can hopefully eventually hire them. But at the same time, by exposing them to real world problems, real world capacities, real world solutions, I think it helps their digital minds, you know, find a better way of doing things. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we want to have, uh, hopefully from this talk, is that if we can, you know, find one-on-one -on -one partnerships where we work with your team, not just across a semester, but across a year, uh, work with, you know, a Phoenix member, uh, provide an interchange of data. We can provide you with a bunch of students that will work on this data. And hopefully they can actually solve some of your, you know, some of the problems together with your, you know, with your employees or with your managers. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Robbie. A anything else to follow that up with, Mix, just in case? You yeah, want I was thinking. Um, I was thinking that. Uh, um, I was thinking that it, this looks like for an um, in institutional partnership, no, rather than our J Phoenix, which is really a partnership between phoenix and the students yes. directly Correct. benefiting without really making arrangements with the school but if we provide this with the school and our membership then yeah this this can work yeah right. Great. thank you yes we Yes, thank you. We'd appreciate that. No, we're happy to sign even any non-disclosure agreement so that we can protect the sanctity of everything that is discussed. And, you know, we're happy to create MOUs and relationships because we feel that, you know, we can really contribute, at least our students you know, can contribute to a lot of the new thinking, especially now that they're being coming through with new skills of data science, data engineering, uh, which, you know, we, we may not have produced in the past, uh, but our new students have a lot of new skills and a new ways of doing things. And so I think uh, by exposing them to your issues, I think that will really create a win-win situation for all. All right. Also, oh, last Very night, big. also ahead, the ahead. membership of Phoenix at the moment is really um, chief financial officers and the like at that level, no? Uh, we have an associate membership and then we have junior Phoenix, no? But um, considering that your uh, students are going into uh, entrepreneurship uh, startups, and they will soon become CEOs or CFOs of their own of their own companies. This might uh, fast track the um, making our membership younger. So thank you very much, Robbie. <laughs> Happy to thank do that. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Mings. Um, if I may, uh, I'd like to also ask again the same question that was asked by uh, one of our participants, Romualdo Bea, earlier. Uh, I'll ask this to Philip. So how did your team, you, you, you may have touched on this earlier, but some of it, but uh, if you can expound, uh, how did your team overcome any barriers to adoption, especially when you first launched the company? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. I, I think it's something that every single startup will face in the very beginning. Um, you know, for us, it was especially a sensitive problem because fundamentally we're, you know, being entrusted by the customer to handle one of the most important transactions of their entire life, which is actually buy a home. And so our belief was that the problem actually existed because when we talk to customers, when we talk to users, um, people always had a common kind of complaint about the issue that actually they faced in their daily lives. And so um, for us, the challenge was not necessarily finding the problem. It was finding the percentage of users. So usually when, when people describe kind of a, a, a startup methodology and finding customers, there's a bell curve. There's a distribution of the early adopters, right? The top 2.5% of people who are almost like the crazy ones, the one who are willing to line up at the Apple store at 5 a.m. to get the new iPhone. So we wanted to find those users, the ones who really, really wanted to try these innovative solutions and were willing to take that risk. And so for us, it was uh, maybe just going through very, you know, creative sources, right? Friends and family in the very beginning to be able to find those uh, initial customers. And once we had those testimonial, uh, testimonials, once we had that very uh, great customer experience, we were able to expand our customer more and more. Uh, but I would say that there's really no easy way around it. Um, and as part of an entrepreneur, you just have to be there. You have to hustle. You just have to talk to a lot of customers and see, you know, who's actually willing to adopt your solution. All right. Uh, thank you, Philip. And then before we, we conclude, I'd like to remind our audience present now and those who will be watching the recording of this in the future, uh, feel free to reach out to Phoenix Secretariat in case you want to get in touch with Darren. Uh, as you know, he, he has uh, Asia Pacific 
coverage over technology and media companies and telecommunications. In the same way with um, any of our upstart uh, contacts, um, feel free to let us know if you want to reach out to either Darius or Philip. And those that are interested to reach out to Dean Rabi, uh, like, likewise, let us know. Uh, one of our main intentions really is to make sure that we link pe people up and hopefully you know, uh, good things will arise uh, from those uh, link ups. So, um, Darren, go going back to you first. So, it, it would seem like, um, so there are different types of techs, right? FinTech, PropTech, InsureTech, RegTech. Um, and uh, based on how Philip described his business, in the same way as Darius, there's always a certain level of overlap, right? Uh, PropTech doesn't just stay within prop tech. It overlaps with some fintech as it relates to bank financing, as it relates to maybe um, the flow of cash uh, between one party to another. So is this a uh, normal model, so to speak, that you've been seeing around the region? So, so instead of different verticals, eventually, maybe it has already started, a convergence of all of these uh, verticals will soon happen oh, absolutely um you know our business our whole world has been built around siloed problem solving and that's why we've had this very silo kind of delivery models and everything but if you focus really on solving the problems and you start to not look at those silos that's where everything starts to cut across silos and so that cutting across silos requires people to be thinking laterally to solving problems with information and data different ways. And that they to using different technologies, um, different alliance partners, different ecosystems. And so I think um, the, the short answer to that is yes, uh, absolutely we are seeing that across multiple parts of the region, uh, everywhere actually. Um, I had a very good example, just we're talking with telcos recently and uh, on the topic of home. You know, I moved home the other day, uh, last year. And when I moved home, I went out and I went from a two bedroom to a four bedroom house and we started to sort of buy all this IoT equipment and uh, cameras. And I spent like quite a amount of money just figuring out where to do all this. And, and you know, telecom companies I work with are saying, I, I need to build more revenues. I said, well, why didn't you just bundle? You knew I moved because I relocated my broadband service. Why didn't you offer me all this stuff, you know, as a service? So it's a very simple problem that I had, but it could have been, and if you think about the information that they have, they actually know probably the floor plan of that home. We, they know information. So information for one company means something to another company. Not only that, I bought home insurance. They could have offered me bundled home insurance. So my point being is that when you start to look at different problem statements, it cuts across different sectors, but the information that means something to you may, not, may mean something more to someone else. And so when you start to think through that customer journey of someone moving home, those possibilities and evolutions of what could happen start to emerge. So just think of that in terms of what happens in the Philippines and how you work in your day-to-day -day and all the problems that you guys talked about. If you start to really think about that and not line up the linear ways or siloed ways of solving problems and look at it horizontally, I think that's where the opportunity does lie and the convergence of multiple sectors using technology will definitely take place. All right, very insightful, Darren, thank you. And then um, I'll ask a question from the audience. This is a question from Mr. Uh, Fred Parungao. Uh, question for you, Philip. Uh, apart from a 20% deposit, what are the other items that you consider in determining if a prospective customer is worth financing? How do you handle delinquent customers? Yeah. Um, so for us, uh, part of kind of our secret sauce is actually our ability to work with customers that maybe they don't qualify for traditional mortgages um, or bank loans, right? Um, for us, when we underwrite, we look at two main buckets of information. The first being the actual underlying asset itself. So when we look at a property or a piece of land, we look at different qualities. Um, you know, mainly valuation, but other, you know, legal issues, potentially um, issues in dispute, issues in li liquidity, uh, ability to be able to sell it within X period of time. 
Um, and we consider all of these uh, factors. And then on the customer side, we'll also look at, you know, for example, your income, uh, your job, uh, your reputation, those kind of things that within the market. And based on those factors, what we determine is actually our comfort level, almost like an ability to, for us to be able to commit, you know, let's say 50% or 30% or 40%. Um, so it would be a sliding scale depending on the result of uh, kind of that evaluation. So, um, so you know, basically, I guess the innovation here is that instead of maybe, you know, is a traditional financial institution where it's very black and white, uh, whether you can finance someone or you cannot, uh, for us, we're able to take all of this data, integrate all of these insights, and then also give customers, you know, a fighting chance, right? A second chance so that maybe traditionally you wouldn't have qualified, but for us, we can work with you, but more on another kind of uh, uh, more empathetic basis. All right. And then another question for you, Philip, if you don't mind. Um, so as you mentioned, currently, uh, this is a question still from Mr. Parungao. Currently, your business is concentrated on home financing. Are you also planning to extend financing to business loans? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so for us, our kind of area of specialty right now is just residential. Uh, so mainly residential uh, properties. Uh, we have worked with some business owners maybe that, you know, maybe they want to use the money for their business. But again, it's, it's you know, uh, our, our focus is residential. And, and and it goes always back to this kind of like uh, thing about focus, right? When you're building a company, uh, you don't want to try to do too many things at once um, because, you know, sometimes it's very easy to be distracted and, you know, be uh, kind of, uh, chasing the next shiny object. Uh, for us, our kind of thesis in terms of building a product is that we want to focus on one or two things, do them very, very well. And once we have enough operational scale, once we are very comfortable with the business, then we'll expand our product more and more. But for now, it's more, more, more on the residential side for sure. All right. Thank you, Philip. And then for Dean Robbie, uh, one question would be, although you've somehow touched on this earlier, um, how can... How can we enlist or bring in more private companies and financial institutions to look at and fund promising startups? So that's a good question. So I think from our end, what we want to do is create a platform for the startups to come to us and be able to, uh, we can help them with the elevator pitches and all their training and the boot camps. And I think, you know, it's not just us doing it, no, but uh, the Department of Science and Technology is really putting a lot of funding across different uh, schools. So our other, you know, our other schools in the country, you know, like UP, La Salle, et cetera, no, we all have these technology-based incubators. And so we will come up with platforms so that they can pitch to would-be investors. No? But I think the challenge from the traditional finance industry is that they need to then retool also because uh, angel and, uh, and equity investment in a startup is very different from uh, you know, from what you need. No? You, it's hard to look at business models or business plans uh, because many times these business plans uh, are not fully formed, right? Because these ideas right. kept iterating and keep pivoting. And therefore, I think there has to be that level of, of change. I'm not yet an expert in this, but some of the things we're already seeing when a traditional investor tries to go and become an angel investor is that they tend to ask too much equity at the upfront, which gives, which really uh, limits the ability of the startup to raise funding in, in future seed rounds, right? And eventually dilutes the ability of the startup to scale, especially since they won't even be able to give stock options to their future employees, right? So uh, right. I think that kind of, you know, mindset change where, you know, you're, you're investing in a startup and not trying to overvalue it at the start or trying to get too much equity at the start, no? So that you can exit, uh, really need to change. It has to be a longer term play. You have to help the startup grow. Uh, and then understand that many times the startup will fall and pivot. So even even in our case, no, our students are very scared to fail. And so we actually are trying to create a system so that they understand that failure is part of the process because there's no way that a startup that is scared of failing will actually succeed. All right, that's very clear, Dean Ravi. Okay, Lo looks like we're uh, almost done. So if I may ask uh, from our panelists uh, their final statements, uh, and if I may ask, Darren, to go first, please. Yeah, I just encourage everyone to to really think about um, uh, making a contribution in terms of you know how can you make a difference. So you know beyond the technology we've discussed, and you know we're trying to solve problems, but I, I think if each of us really think about um, how do we make a difference in what we are seeing in the markets we play, 
I think that would start to really get us thinking about, you know, how can we then solve problems using technology and then perhaps them being the next emerging giant. So that would be my last word. All right. Thank you very much, Darren. We appreciate your time uh, with us. Um, Dean Ravi, can I go to you for your uh, final statements? Yeah, so again, thank you to Phoenix for allowing us this platform. And I think uh, from what I might take away here, you know, is that we're very challenged by, you know, what Philip and Darius have created. And of course, uh, we want to be in Darren's report next time. No, because uh, we feel that the Philippines is on the cusp of a startup explosion and the next emerging giants will come from here. So we want Ateneo and Phoenix to play a strong role in this program. And so my last challenge is, you know, watch the space. You know, uh, a lot of interesting things will happen. All right. Very encouraging and fighting words, uh, Dean Robbie. We'd be happy to discuss. No? Let's help each other out. Uh, Philip, over to you. But, but before your final statement, I have a quick question. I, I forgot to ask. Um, using your technology, do you finance homes directly or are you a conduit between the home buyer and the banks? Yes, um, actually the former. So we are the ones who actually raise the capital and are the ones who actually are giving the customers the money. Um, yeah, so very, very, uh, very capital intensive, but, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, very, uh, different than, than a lot of the other traditional models, I would say. I see. All right. With that, uh, we'd like to hear from you, uh, your, um, uh, closing statements. Yeah. Yeah. Th um, I mean, I think, you know, definitely thank you to Phoenix for, you know, put on a very, very well organized, uh, you know, webinar and, you know, le I learned a lot definitely from, from Darren and Darius and Dean Robbie as well. Um, I think, you know, for us at Homebase, we're definitely, you know, lucky to be in this position of, uh, you know, a, a very young startup and, you know, having achieved some kind of traction. But for us, it's still very early. And I think part of our belief is that Southeast Asia and the Philippines, Vietnam has that potential to really create these really innovative, life-changing companies in the future. So, you know, if anyone is interested in fintech or real estate technology um, in the Philippines and, you know, thinks that, you know, home base or I could be of any help, please feel free to reach out. I'm definitely happy to talk. Um, even, you know, some of the students, you know, we, we're happy to work with students from the Philippines if it helps develop the future leaders of fintech. So, um, yeah, definitely look forward to, you know, catching up with you guys. And, and thanks so much again for the great presentation and this, this amazing platform for you guys to, 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 to host us. All right. Uh, thank you, Philip. Thank you, Dean Robbie. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, my role is done. Um, <laughs> I'd like to hand it back to our MC, uh, Jing. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for that insightful discussion. Philip, Darren, President Mike, and Dean Robbie. We, we have learned a lot this morning. And now, as a way of giving thanks, may I ask our President, Mike Corrine, to proceed with the awarding of the Certificates of Appreciation. Thank you, Jing. Uh, and then if I may ask Secretariat to start sharing. Uh, we'll definitely send this over to you. Uh, first to Mr. An. So Phoenix presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Mr. Philip An in recognition of his generosity in sharing his valuable time, knowledge, and insights as a guest speaker in the 2022 Phoenix Annual Conference with the theme, Emerging Giants in Asia Pacific, The Secrets to Business Success. Given the seventh day of October 2022 via Zoom, signed by yours truly. Philip, it was truly very inspiring. Uh, it, it's always good to hear that uh, a lot of good things can still happen you know, in a very uh, relatively short period of time. We know the, all the hard work you've done and you, you serve as an inspiration for us. Thank you very much for that, Philip. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate the kind words. Yeah. And right. thanks, thanks so much for inviting me for uh, being here as well. Okay, and next to our, one of the regional bosses of KPMG. Uh, so Phoenix would like to give the certificate of appreciation to Mr. Darren Young. Thank you, Darren, for sharing your valuable time. We, we know how busy you are and how we, and now you've proven how supportive you are. Uh, and we appreciate all the insights and all the knowledge that you shared. Um, during our 2022 Phoenix Annual Conference uh, held this morning, and then I'd like to give you the certificate uh, today, given the 7th day of October via Zoom, signed by yours truly. Thank you very much, Darren. Thanks, uh, Mike. Thank you, Phoenix. And uh, we've had a great time. So uh, 
was more than happy to to join today. So uh, great to meet all my fellow fellow panelists as well. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Darren. And then last but not the least would be to our professor, <laughs> Dean. So Phoenix would like to present the certificate of appreciation to Dean Roberto Martin Galang uh, for your generosity, Dean, uh, in sharing your valuable time, the plans you have, uh, your very impressive plans, no, uh, and helping the university pivot to become a more relevant university and help out you know, the community as a whole. So we appreciate your presence during our 20, 2022 Phoenix Annual Conference with the theme Emerging Giants in Asia Pacific, The Secret of Business Success, given today, 7th of October. And from me personally, thank you. Uh, we truly appreciate uh, the commitment that Time is always very hard to come by. We appreciate that you spent, we're almost three hours into the call and we truly appreciate it, Dean. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you, Mike. No, we really appreciate all this uh, partnership that we've had with Phoenix over the years and we look forward to continuing this partnership. So we'll see you guys at the Intercollegiate Finance Competition. No, we'll, nice. Ateneo will be there. <laughs> okay, uh, back to you, Attorney Jing. Thank you, President Mike, and our esteemed speakers and panelists. To wrap up today's uh, event, may I ask the liaison director of Phoenix Week Committee, Ms. Gemma O'Cheng, to deliver her closing message. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Gemma. Yes. Very interesting discussions this morning, don't you think? I believe no one will disagree with me if I say that it was a morning well spent. Phoenix theme this year is about inspiring market confidence and empowering positive change. In support of the theme, the organizers behind this week's conference wanted to direct attention to the challenges and the factors supportive of transformative change. From the first day of our annual Phoenix Week activity, where we invited speakers to talk about the transformative power of finance in life and business to today's session, Keynote speakers in this class and spoke about what the future will look like and gave us ideas of the different areas where and how we can prepare for a transformative future. It is re really fitting that our Phoenix Week Capstone is today's topic on the secret to the business success of the emerging giants in Asia Pacific. So many buzzwords, pain points, digital platforms, innovation, collaboration, and so on. We hope today's session in fact, the whole week sessions will provide ideas about how we can bring our businesses to become one of the future emerging giants of Asia Pacific, or even just the Philippines, so timely as we enter our respective corporate planning activities. I hope we all leave this conference week with the belief that it's everyone's personal responsibility to do something about contributing to transformational change, whether we start with our backyards or like the esteemed Maria Ressa on the global stage, change is imperative and rests within each of us. As she said in our conference last Wednesday, your courage determines the fate of humanity. So where, uh, whatever your passion or wherever it lies, do something about it. I recently um, resumed taking Pilates classes and there are, there's this uh, challenging word posted on the wall, which I'd like to share with you. It says there, uh, your future self will thank you for it. So keep that in mind. On behalf of the board of the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines and the Phoenix Week Committee, we wish to thank our dear speakers for the very inspiring discussions today. Likewise, we thank all our participants for your interest and support in our annual Phoenix Week activities. Thank you one and all. Have a good day. Thank you, Gemma, for your inspiring message. Again, we would like to thank all our participants, guest speakers, and panelists. This event would not have been possible if not for the support of our sponsors and partners. So we would like to thank them, KP Manabat, KPMG Manabat & Company, Union Bank, Mega World, CDO Food Spear, NOAA Business Applications, Vista Land, All Home, Ayala Land, Deloitte, the Institute of Management Accountants, Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation, Robinson's Land Corporation, Smart Communications, SGV and Company, BDO, FTI Consulting, PNA Grant Thornton, San Miguel Corporation, RCBC, St. Peter Life Plans, McDonald's, and Wilcon Depot. 
We would also like to thank our broadcast partners, ANC and CNN Philippines, and to our media partners, Business Mirror, Business World, Manila Bulletin, Philippine Star, and the Manila Times. Once again, a warm thank you to our dear sponsors and partners for supporting this year's Phoenix Annual Conference. Thank you very much. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Mabuhay ang Phoenix. Signing off. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Happy weekend, everyone. <laughs> Have a great Friday. Philip, take care. Uh, hope to see you on your next trip to the Philippines. And Darren, thank you, thank you sir. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.